Good afternoon, welcome to Senate Education. Today is Wednesday, January 11th at 1.30. Uh, we're going to kick things off by talking about school meals, child nutrition. We're then going to jump into part one of something I talked to the committee about last week is what does a Vermont education look like? We're going to jump in with around test scores and things like that. Uh, and we're gonna to move to school safety. Everyone may recall uh, last, yesterday we heard from Secretary French about school safety. And then uh, wrap things up with financial literacy. I don't know if it'll take us all the way to 4.30, but that is the schedule. We have uh, Senator Weeks uh, on Zoom who is participating and uh, not feeling so hot, so we appreciate him actually um, being remote. Yeah. Can you hear us okay, Senator? I can hear you fine, thank you. Okay, great, and we can hear you as well. So, uh, Senators may recall, last year we passed a bill uh, that is in session law, which uh, is temporary, as we heard yesterday, um, reviewing the little expertise I have. Uh, uh, and. Uh, it basically extended universal school meals for one year. So things wrap up, I believe, July 1, 2023. Is that accurate? Yes. And one of the leaders on this issue uh, is uh, Anor Horton, who is with us today. The other one I always think of is Senator Starr, who really led on this issue. And Anor Horton is with, the, is with Hunger Free Vermont. Thrilled to have you here. Thrilled to hear sort of just how things are going, what you're seeing, and uh, but also would love to hear a little bit about you and Hunger Free Vermont since everyone here is, save for me, a new committee member. So with that, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Senator Campion. For the record, I am Anora Horton. I'm the executive director of Hunger Free Vermont. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with um, all of you today. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here to tell you all um, a little bit about the Universal School Meals Act and to let you know really how well it's working right now to end hunger and stigma in our schools and to make healthy meals available to every student at every meal um, every day in our public schools and some of our independent schools as well. And it's doing this in the most equitable way and I'm also really excited to be here just to learn what's important to you and what questions you have so that I can get you the answers. And um, as we work together this session to wrap up this work and make the funding for Vermont's Universal School Meals program permanent in the education fund. And the first thing I want to say is that I'm really able to be here today to talk to you about Universal School Meals because of the great work that was done last year with this committee leading the way. And I especially want to thank Senator Campion for his leadership on this issue. I'm really happy to be back here in this room and back working with this committee again. So most of us are meeting each other for the first time right now. So I am gonna start with a little bit about myself and Hunger Free Vermont. And sorry to interrupt you, I hope sure. I have to do this again. I just wanna let you know, uh, Ms. Horton, that uh, the two individuals from schools have just zoomed in. So when you're ready, oh, they are there great. watching and uh, but you're in charge. So whatever works for you. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Yes. Hi friends. <laughs> it's very strange to have you in behind <laughs> me so that I can't see you <laughs> that way. I guess, yeah, okay. It doesn't make a difference to them if I turn around, only to me. All right, um, getting used to this hybrid world <laughs> or trying to. So, um, so Hunger Free Vermont is a statewide nonprofit. We are turning 30 in 2023. And our mission is to end the injustice of hunger and malnutrition for everyone in Vermont. So we do a lot of different kinds of work um, uh, toward that mission. We work in coalitions to advocate for permanent and dignified solutions to hunger at the federal, state, and local levels. We educate the public about the causes of and the solutions to hunger. We conduct outreach on the federal nutrition program. So school meals is one set of federal nutrition programs, but there's childcare meals and there's Meals on Wheels and there's Three Squares Vermont and, there, and WIC. There are many, many federal nutrition programs and we work on pretty much all of them. 
So we do outreach um, all across Vermont on those programs to help people learn about them and know how they can apply. We provide free and customized consulting and training to the entities like senior centers, community action agencies, food shelves, childcare providers, schools, area agencies on aging, um, and many more um, that use the federal nutrition programs in one way or another, or that help people apply to access the federal nutrition programs. We also support 10 regional hunger councils that cover all of the state and a little bit of the Upper Valley of New Hampshire, thrown in there for good measure. Um, and they're made up of local community leaders who work on the specific hunger challenges in their regions. And I would like to pause right here to encourage all of you to join your hunger councils, because um, you all have one. Um, you can go to our website and, and, and uh, sign up to get um, information, notices, the agendas, and all of that for those meetings. Um, and you know, Hunger Free Vermont is available to you. We're available to help you help your constituents, constituents connect to food resources. And so please use us for that. Uh, I live in Williston, and I've been at Hunger Free Vermont for almost 12 years. Uh, when I started, I was hired as the manager of our child nutrition programs advocacy and support work. And I was shocked to learn how broken the traditional school meal system was. Um, I really had no idea before I started working at Hunger Free Vermont that our, the school meal program in the old way that it works um, segregates kids by family income in the school cafeteria. It causes so much shame and stigma that many low income students prefer to go hungry than to get the meals that they're eligible for. Many families won't even fill out the intrusive and intimidating application. Um, the eligibility cutoff for free meals is so low that up to 40% of the kids here in our state right now um, who need school meals don't qualify for free school meals and they wouldn't be able to get those meals if we didn't have Act 151 in place right now. Universal school meals replaces all of these inequities with dignity and it ensures that all students can focus and learn, and it relieves social, emotional, and economic stress for kids, families, and educators. And that is why it is my passion. And um, I wanna just tell you, I wanna just give you the overview of what the Universal School Meals Act does. And then maybe we can hear um, from um, the experts on the ground <laughs> uh, a little bit about what's happening in, in one school district in Vermont right now with Universal Meals. So the Universal School Meals Act is not a very complicated bill, although there is very precise and technical language in that policy that's really important because it ensures that Vermont's Universal School Meals program works with the complicated federal rules that govern school meal programs and govern federal reimbursements for school, school meals. But what it does is it, it created a one-year universal school meals program that provides free breakfast and lunch to all public school students. And that one year is the current school year that we're in. Um, also approved independent schools that are physically located in Vermont can participate in the one year universal school meals program if they choose to for those students who attend their school on public tuition dollars. Vermont's education fund supplements the federal per meal reimbursements so that school meal programs receive the full free rate um, amount for each meal that they serve and that rate the, the rate of reimbursement is set by the federal government and the Universal School Meals Act in Vermont um, just uses that same free reimbursement rate as the rate per meal. Um, so so um, it covers every breakfast and lunch that are served to students that meet the federal nutrition rules that don't qualify for the full free rate of federal reimbursement. It makes up the difference between the federal reimbursement for that meal and the total free reimbursement rate for that meal. And um, Act 151 also created a one-year moratorium on the ability of a school district to ask for an exemption from participation in a school meals program. In other words, 
right now in Vermont for the first time ever, um, every single public school is providing breakfast and lunch to all students because the act required the last two schools that weren't doing that to find a way to do it. And they did find a way to do it and they're doing it now. So that is how the um, Universal School Meals Program works. And um, I have a few broad things to say about the benefits, but I think where you're really going to get clear about what the benefits are is from listening to the superintendent and the um, school food program co-director uh, for the Harwood Union Unified School District. And they joined me. So I think I'll hand it over to them. Should we turn it over to them? Terrific. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Superintendent, would you like to sure. would you like to, to start and then uh, Ms. Dolan, if, if you want to follow up, whatever order you'd like to go in. Sure, and I provided a full copy of my remarks to uh, to the committee, so feel free to reference those, and I'll, I'll I'll try to be brief in my remarks. But I I do want to thank the chairman and the members of the committee for having us. Uh, we think that Act One Fifty One is a tremendous opportunity for schools throughout Vermont. And uh, we're so pleased to hear that you're considering uh, the program for future years. Uh, my name is Mike Licklider. I'm the superintendent of the school district and, and we're right here in Washington County. In fact, I'm at Brookside Primary School today. Both principals are at a training, so I'm the substitute elementary principal. So if the, uh, if, if the, the, the bell rings or a student, a little student comes in, you'll understand. Um, but uh, I, I, this is my first year as a superintendent in Harwood. It's my first year in Vermont. We moved to South Duxbury at the end of June, uh, but I have been a superintendent. I've been a principal and a teacher for over 30 years. Uh, we moved from Pennsylvania for the last 13 years. I was a school superintendent in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, in a school district of about 5,400 students. So I've, I've had a lot of experience in lunches, uh, working with students and families to make sure that, that we have all students who are fed. Um, one of the reasons my wife and I contemplated a move to Vermont uh, based on a, a long history of traveling here, uh, having a daughter who uh, most recently was a student at the University of Vermont, is just because of your commitment to children and, and the climate of the state. And I think this is the, the most recent example I have that makes me proud to be a superintendent in, in this area right now. Uh, I have three very specific examples I can give you related to the positive differences that, that this program has made for our students right here in Harwood. I can tell you that if you speak to any one of the principals in this district, uh, you will have big champions for continuing this program. I can also tell you from just being in cafeteria duty with, uh, with uh, primary school children that uh, I mentioned to the three cafeteria workers that I was gonna be testifying to you and they said to let you know that uh, the three cafeteria workers at Brookside and Waterbury, Vermont are fully supportive of the program as well. Uh, but just three examples I can give to you uh, they are real life examples. I've changed names and a little bit of the circumstances just to protect the families. Uh, but th the three points I wanna make is number one, that many of our students do not eat breakfast and they come to school hungry. Uh, and as educators, we know as you know, classroom teachers, principals, that, that a full stomach guarantees that we can focus on education and, and teaching the student the, the most important uh, elements of the day, whether it's reading or math or art or any of the other experiences that students have. Um, prior to the pandemic, this school district and Erica, who is just a wonderful, uh, does a wonderful job with our food service program, worked very hard to increase breakfast participation uh, with little results. Uh, we had some students who took advantage of it, but, but it, was a, it was a smaller number. And in spite of all their efforts, uh, they could not increase that number. With the pandemic, uh, with universal meals, we've seen our numbers for breakfast almost double. Uh, this morning, as our students walk in here, the staff has done a great job. The students get off the bus and walk in. We hand them a meal if they want one. Uh, they go to class. They sit in their class. They have their breakfast. And that makes a big difference in the lives of many of our students. Let me talk to you about Sam. Sam is a young student. He's in third grade. Uh, his mom often struggles to get him out of bed in the morning, get him to the bus stop in time to get the bus. Uh, it's very common for him to skip breakfast. So he comes to school hungry. He also has some disruptive behaviors that he can show in the classroom. And as, as the teacher and the principal really worked to understand Sam and some of his, these behaviors, they realized that, that they're directly tied to him being hungry. Uh, he, he displays those behaviors when he has not eaten. So what this program has done is really has allowed 
him to be the school to ensure that he can get a meal every day, that he doesn't have to worry about whether his mom can pay for that meal, uh, but but they can provide for him. And if you talk to students, uh, if you talk to teachers at the school, you'll also learn that many of our teachers buy snacks in the grocery store on a regular basis for their students, especially in the past who come to school who are hungry so that they can uh, give them something to eat to have them focus on, on reading and, and the lesson of the day. So uh, Sam, because of that, has developed an amazing relationship with our cafeteria chef in that building. Uh, he, he really has uh, latched on to this person and looks to her because of her love and support for him. So I think this is an example of eating breakfast at school really makes a difference in the life of a children, a child, and especially makes a difference because of uh, the fact that he can focus on, on his classes. The second example I'll give you, uh, and this goes under the, the category of teenagers often choose not to eat due to the social stigma of a free lunch. I've seen this as a teacher, I've seen it as a principal, I've seen it as a superintendent. Uh, I was recently talking to one of our administrators at Harwood Union Middle School High School, and the one principal gave me an example of a student I'll call Sydney. Uh, she's a teenager. She relies on our Harwood cafeteria as her only reliable food source every day. Uh, she recently spoke to one of the principals while she was in the lunch line and said that this has made a big difference to her, this program, because uh, she said it makes it easier for her to get lunch as opposed to the other years when it was the perception of many students and their classmates that only the free kids stand in line for lunch. So that often that social stigma would cause her to not eat, to not get lunch. So she said the fact that it's known that everyone can have a free lunch makes a big difference as part of this universal program. Uh, and, and, and that has seen a, a, has an effect in, in our number of lunches. While our breakfasts have nearly doubled, uh, lunches have not doubled, but there's been a significant increase that Eric can talk to you about as well. So for teenagers, uh, it's a very important program as well. And then finally, I'd say that uh, uh, we have many struggling families who do not meet the federal free and reduced lunch criteria. And I'll give you the example of the Smith family. They have three children. Prior to the pandemic, they would historically carry a very high lunch date uh, debt every year. Both parents work. One of the parents holds multiple jobs. They have three growing children uh, who, who eat a lot of food. Uh, and uh, they, they're kids who are really good kids in our school. They work hard. Uh, they get along with others. They do everything that we would want a child to do in our school system. Uh, but lunch and, and, and paying for lunch has been a challenge for this. It was always a sticky point for the relationship that the school had with the family. Uh, it was often heartbreaking for the cafeteria worker who ran the register to tell the one student that your lunch account's in the negative. Uh, when, when the principal had to speak with the parent about it, the parent would also often say, you know, I forgot to check this week, I'll bring it in next week. Uh, and, and, but the principal knew that it was a challenge for the family in spite of them being just hard worker, hardworking Vermonters. So this program has made a difference in the life of that family, that that's not something that that child has to worry about when they walk into the cafeteria, uh, having that lunch person say, you know what, you're out of money. We'll still provide a lunch, but you'll need to bring in a check later. Um, you know, as, as an educator, I believe that our free public schools are a hallmark of our nation. Uh, when our kids come in in the morning, there's no cash registers at the door asking them to pay in order to learn to read. So I just asked the committee to consider that as we decide whether uh, we should really have a cash register in, in the cafeteria as kids get lunch so that they can focus on learning. So, you know, I really appreciate your emphasis. I appreciate the advocacy of Hunger Free Vermont. And uh, Erica is the expert on, on the cafeteria. She does a wonderful job. Uh, we invite any of you who want to see our program uh, to, to visit, to, to come, uh, let us know. We'd be glad to provide a lunch or breakfast and uh, let you spend some time with some of our students in the cafeteria. So, Erica. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, first of all, thank you so much for uh, having us here. This is a great opportunity. I had um, testified before to other committees and um, this is just a privilege that we are proud that we can um, be the experts, I guess. Um, so um, my name is Erica Dolan. I'm the Harwood uh, Union School District Food and Nutrition Co-Director. I've been with Harwood now for 15 years. Um, Prior to consolidation, I was with um, for from eleven years with the Waterbury Duxbury School District, and I have been with um, the Harwood for four years now, with a total of fifteen years. Um, 
So I live a, lo a long time with meals that were not um, free to students. And I have, um, you know, um, experienced the, the stigma that we've been all talking about in, in between students and um, the hardships, the families that do not qualify for free meals uh, passed through all those years. Um, I would like to start that um, since my first day as a director, I had the dream that meals would be free. I had spoke freely and out loud about this from day one, that that would be one dream that I had before I retired in 30 years. So <laughs> I, I still have at least 17 years here. So I, 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 I think I, <laughs> I, I have to find another project now, another goal. So I'm, I'm it, it's pretty impressive that we were able to accomplish this. Uh, with your help so fast. I'm very, very thankful. I couldn't say it, I couldn't say enough. Uh, it's hard to believe that something so devastating devastating like COVID ignite the this, you know, this movement. So I have to say thank you to COVID a little bit for this. So um so what can I say about our district? We um have very low parts we traditionally have very low participation of free and reduced kids. So our the main meals that we always serve were to kids that were paid. Um, so we had a very high percentage of kids that do not qualify for free meals. Um, over the years, well, let's, let's start from the beginning. When I first started here, we used to have a model that um, Every time the kid came to the lunch line and they had a negative balance, we would tell the kid, you know, either give them a little paper or say, you have a negative balance. You got to bring this note home. Or um, we were always telling the kid <laughs> once they get their trace. So the registered person was trained to tell this child that they had a negative balance, that their, their account was in that, the negative. So this child went through went through the lunch line, got their little no, went to sit, and was carrying that burden, their family burden in their shoulders. And I thought that was devastating. So that was one of the first things I advocated to change in the Waterbury, Duxbury School District, that no kid should ever receive a note at the register before they get their meals. So with them, we've um, heavily send bills out you know back in the day we used to mail them with paper and then we suddenly move quickly to emails but as you can imagine i became a bill collector so part of my job was to collect bills to make phone calls to ensure that parents were paying their bills and that took a lot of my time hours per week and um, it wasn't just me. All the principals that came through this building also helped in this process. Sometimes we used to divide the list, um, and the list was pretty big, and the bills were accumulating. And no matter what we did, it seems that that problem was always there. And we helped the families fill it up applications. We helped them ensure that they could qualify for free meals. We did our work, and it was a lot of time that I was spent not taking care of nutrition, not taking care of kids, and but taking care of money, of cash. And then suddenly, now we're free. And I don't need to do that anymore. And I, I know I'm talking a little bit about myself, and I'm going to go into the kids here, but I want to put, put that out that we are no longer bill collectors right now. And we are investing, we are creating, we actually have some time to improve our programs, to market it, to make it better, to invest in our local economy with the food incentive grants. So part of school meals and meals are very healthy, local and fresh. So we, we wanna spend our time doing that. We wanna spend our time investing in what kids need the most. And they do not need us to be um, spending our time collecting, calling parents regarding to that. So that's a big part of like how this was affecting me personally in my the job that I do. Um, one thing that we always talk about here is that kids are not paying for anything else in the school. And Dr. Mike mentioned that before, that we don't have registers at the entrance of the schools. And we, you know, we 
education in this country, in this state, it had become something that we provide to kids. Provision, providing to their well-being, providing for them to be whole, to be a human being, to give it back to their community, to, you know, full circle as a, a an adult. Um, that became something that is, we all can agree, an educator can agree that we provide way more than just classroom, classroom uh, education and like in between math and um, um, English and, and languages, we are providing wellness, physical education. We provide even driver's ed to school and to students. Providing meals is no different. Meals are part of education as everything else. Um, and I know that ha this has not been the culture of the country or the culture of the state to that meals are part of education in that sense but it shouldn't be anything different. I have a daughter in ninth grade and she, I'm, I live in Berrytown, by the way, I didn't say that for the record in the beginning. So I'm resident of Berrytown and I have a daughter in ninth grade at Spalding High School. So I told her yesterday that I was gonna come and she was a page last year in the state house. So, um, so I, I, I talked to her yesterday that I was gonna come, you know, talk to you guys today. And I asked her, so what, what, what does it change for you? How is it different in your world that meals are free now? <laughs> and she stopped for a little bit. She wasn't too sure how to answer. And then she said, well, it's hard to say what I'm gonna say, but it's almost like we are, it's the law that we have to be educated. I cannot just drop off school right now. You, you There will be consequences for all of us if I'm not at school right now. And everything is provided to me. Meals are no different. They should just, and, she, and it was good that she used the same word that I always use, the provision of meals. And she said, we, it's almost like it's mandatory that we're we are there. I know it's not that way. That's not the right word that I wanna say, but we have to be there. And meal, meals, I would not make through my day if I didn't have meals. So in, that was kind of her little way to say that she couldn't learn if she wasn't fed. Um, and I, I, I believe that she's taking way, she's in that category that she's taking way more meals like every day now um, because they're free than otherwise. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that I don't need to be worrying about her going to school and being hungry because she is getting what she needs. Um, to, to be able to learn. Um, one thing that happened at Howard High School that is very interesting and it, it ties back to the register again. We decided um, as Harwood High School, actually in all the schools, but Harwood majority because we used to sell a lot of a la carte items to students at Harwood High School. We decided that we were not selling anything. There's not even one single student that can purchase one single item in our schools. So our cafeterias are not selling anything. There is no money transactions. Only the teachers are, are buying meals, uh, breakfast and lunch, but no student, ha we have no transactions because a la carte items just goes back to the same problem that we are um, identifying who has the money, who doesn't have the money to pay. So we, move away from that at Hartwood. And I'm proud that we made that, that choice. Um, so I think my ask is to make the universal meals permanent in the educational fund, education fund. I have, um, you know, I'm available to answer any questions right now, but I think you got, got my, you know, where my passion really is. Thank you, That's I appreciate true. it. It was great testimony, both of you. Thanks very much. Uh, committee, we are, uh, and for those watching and here, we're just really jumping into this today. This will be a longer conversation. We're going to look at, uh, you know, the, the education budget and other uh, pressures on it, if you will, over the next few weeks. But this is a terrific way to kick things off. Any questions at this point for uh, any of our guests? Uh, Senator Hashim. Huh? I just wanted to put my own plug in for uh, universal school meals, if that's okay. Absolutely. Uh, you know, probably one of the most impactful things that I did during my campaign was going to a school, Bells Falls, that had uh, 
universal school meals, and we sat down with a big table of students from all sorts of different backgrounds, and you know, the thing that they all shared in common was what a positive impact the school meals, um, the universal school meals had on their performance, their ability to pass their driver's tests, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, so it was, it was really awesome. And you know, I'd, I'd encourage anyone and everyone who's a legislator to go to a school that does this program to, to talk to the students and really see what type of impact it has. No, I, I appreciate that. I, I would also add, I think, I love the connection between local farms. I love that, that economic uh, connection. Uh, and also, I do believe if, if young people are eating well early on in their lives, they're going to, it's, it's going to prevent illness in the future and perhaps less stress on our health care system down the road. So, other questions before we uh, move on? Any final comments from you, Ms. Horton? Just a, just a couple of things. Please, absolutely. So, um, Hunger Free Vermont is an anti-hunger organization. So I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say a quick word about what is happening in our state with hunger and the relationship between that and the difference that Universal School Meals is making right now. Um, we have never seen hunger and food insecurity at the rates that people in Vermont are experiencing them right now. Um, in the last 12 months in our state, according to research um, from uh, UVM faculty research group, two in five people in Vermont have reported experiencing food insecurity to some degree. That's 40% of our folks. And for families with children, the rate is even higher than that. And so the Farm Fresh School Meals for All package, which includes universal school meals, the local food purchasing incentive, which you, you heard Erica speak about, and the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grants program that provides technical assistance to help schools and farms connect with each other. Um, that's a piece of the food security puzzle for our families. It's a really important piece right now. All of the other pandemic, economic, emergency relief programs have already gone away or they're going away, including the emergency increased allotments for three squares per month, which are going to be ending in a month. And what's left for some of these families now is universal school meals. That is a, a one little floorboard <coughs> under their ability to um, meet their basic needs. And we've heard from a lot of parents about the relief that, that the existence of this program as a stable source of meals for their kids um, is for them. And I, I just want to make sure that I name that. Um, the Agency of Education is, is working on the kind of hard and specific data, and I'm gonna let them do that. Um, but I do wanna say that we're seeing increased participation by students um, this year in school meals. We're seeing increased purchasing of local food by schools. We, um, there are links between the way that Vermont um, designed the Universal School Meals program that's in place right now and our ability to maximize other federal dollars like pandemic EBT payments um, for this school year and this coming summer. Um, the, uh, Vermont has just been accepted into a, a pilot to directly certify students for free meals through Medicaid and that's going to actually really allow um, <laughs> Uh, the program to draw down more federal funding starting starting next year. Um, and there's pots, a little bit of positive sign at the federal level, this might be the last time I'm gonna say this for a little while, but um, <laughs> that, that there will be some changes, administrative changes to these, the federal universal school meals provisions that are going to allow more schools in Vermont to do universal school meals more easily and perhaps draw down additional federal funding as well. So this is a national movement that Vermont is a leader in. And um, you know that's that's a really exciting thing. Um, Senator Gulick. Oh, sorry. No, please. OK, I just had a quick question. 
the Medicaid program, is that also a program that kind of covers costs um, that aren't covered for folks who don't get free and reduced lunch? Is that sort of the similar, does it cost the, is, am I making sense? I might not be. I'm not quite clear what um, you're so asking. So there are, there are those students who um, are able to get free lunches through the free and reduced lunch program, mm -hmm. correct? Okay, and then there are those who don't qualify. Yes. Um, would the Medicaid program that you just mentioned cover those students? How, how would it, I guess I'm asking yeah. what its relationship would be with free yes. and reduced lunch. Um, so, so no, um, it won't. The Medicaid uh, directly certifying students for free meals through Medicaid will not help um, the students in families who are over income for school meals count as low income for school meals, but it will identify more students who are being missed right now, and that will allow the schools providing universal meals to draw to count more students as eligible for the free rate and therefore it will mean that the program is paid for more with federal dollars and and less with state dollars thank you for clarifying that yes you're welcome it's all very um complicated <laughs> and it's taken me 12 years and i still am learning so no problem <laughs> um i also just want to say um you know, for, for members of this committee, you all in your districts that you represent prevent, present a really good example of what is typical for what's uh, our situation in, in our Vermont school districts. Um, where what's not only, without universal school meals, not only do we not have equity among students in a given school, but we don't have, but all schools in a district can't provide universal school meals necessarily. So we we have students, you know, uh, in the same family who are going to different schools in the same district, and one kid can have universal meals and the others can't under under the pre-pandemic system. And within your districts, you have town. You have very, a lot of inequity among your towns. So for the Rutland district, for the Bennington district, for the Wyndham district, you all have one large town, and in that town you have a sufficient kind of concentration of population and therefore of low income families where all or at least some of your schools uh, were offering universal meals before the pandemic. And they were able to provide universal meals in those larger towns without a lot of additional cost to, uh, at the, on the local taxpayer. But all the rest of your districts are rural towns with small schools, and none of them were able to provide universal school meals in that way. And then for um, uh, Senator Gulick, your district, so the Winooski schools and almost some, but not all of the Burlington schools have been able to provide universal school meals at no additional cost to taxpayers <coughs> for many years. But Colchester and Essex are would are not able to do that on their own in the same way. And so Act 151 really transformed that system where, you know, um, we don't have to explain, you don't have to explain to your constituents and superintendents don't have to explain to parents um, why it is that students in one town have universal meals, but students in another town can't. And that is, we, we want to we want to really, um, you know, make permanent this transformation that we've had in equity in our school systems with universal meals. Great. We do have another guest who needs yes. to uh, jump in because uh, we've slotted about an hour for this. Any final comments from you? Yeah. Well, I do want to um, close by acknowledging Vermont's Agency of Education. Um, they have really worked incredibly, incredibly hard to successfully transition all school, all public schools in Vermont to universal meals this year. Um, I just want to acknowledge thank them you. because without their efforts, they we, we would never get here. And I want to thank this committee for designing a bill that's working really, really well right now. Um, and I'm really looking forward to continuing to, to work with you. Thank Great. you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kruger. Great. 
Ms. Kruger, uh, before you begin, I, I do want to tell you and the committee that you uh, are just a really recognized public servant uh, by so many people in between this committee and the Agriculture Committee uh, for your dedication and everything you do around school nutrition. And so I hope you know that, but if you don't, I'm, or even if you do, I'm telling you again how much everybody appreciates your work. So uh, with that, Thank you. The floor is yours. Appreciate hearing that. Um, uh, so for the record, Rosie Kruger, I'm the State Director of Child Nutrition Programs at the Agency of Education. Um, I manage a team of about eight and a half people at the agency um, who uh, manage all the, the child nutrition programs um, in Vermont. Um, and these are federal programs. Um, so we are the state agency that implements these federal programs. There are extensive federal regulations around how they have to be implemented. So um, we will often hear like, well, why don't we just do it this way or, or make things simpler or eliminate this piece of paperwork. And while we would love to do that, we can't do that if we want to continue to draw down the federal funds. Um, so um, the report on universal school meals, um, which I am frantically writing, um, we just got the, yeah. the data that yeah. we need um, for the first few months of the school year to be able to um, get you some real analysis of how things are working and what the money looks like, which I know is something you're particularly curious about. So I'm not really gonna talk about that at all today. Um, instead, I wanna give you kind of a foundation about school meals um, and the federal child nutrition programs. And I wanna point you in the direction of some resources where you can learn more so that when we come back to you with that report and start to have a conversation about what's next, um, you've got a real a solid understanding and, and don't, <laughs> you know what the abbreviations mean and, and all of that. So, um, so as I mentioned, these are federal programs. Um, the, the big one is the National School Lunch Program and the School Breakfast Program. We also have a couple of other school nutrition programs. Um, the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, which provides um, a fresh fruit or vegetable um, snack outside of meal times in low-income schools and elementary schools, and the after-school snack service, um, which also provides a, an after-school snack. Um, and then we have the summer meals program, um, which provides meals when school is out of session um, during the summer, but also actually during emergency situations and disaster situations when school is closed. And we use that extensively during COVID. Um, and then we have the child and adult care food program, which provides meals to kids in child care, as, as you might guess, um, both in child care centers and um, daycare homes, as well as um, in adult day centers. And we just have a few of those in the state. Um, and that program also can be used to provide meals to kids in um, uh, emergency shelters. Uh, we don't currently do that. Um, and it can also be used to provide um, at-risk after-school suppers in low-income communities. Um, and then in addition, um, our team also operates the USDA Foods Program, which is um, food that the federal government purchases to support um, all of these programs, um, as well as to support uh, vulnerable folks through food pantries. So a lot of that food comes through the Agency of Education but goes directly to the Vermont Food Bank um, to, for distribution to their partners. So that is what my team is doing, is kind of implementing all of those federal programs and the funds that go along with them. Um, we do have some state law around these programs. Um, so we do have a state law that requires public schools to offer breakfast and lunch through the National School Lunch Program. Prior to Act 151, there was an exemption process, and we had two schools in the state who were using that exemption process and not offering those meals to their students. Act 151 temporarily eliminated that exemption process, as you heard from Anor, and those schools are now offering it. But that's definitely something to think about um, as you're moving forward in terms of whether you want to return to how things were previously or, or continue that, um, that requirement. Scrooge, may I interrupt for a moment? Yeah. Are there, and I'm sorry if you've already said this, are there nutritional standards? In other words, I do yes. remember once going yep. into a school, I mean, this was many, many years ago, where the lunch that was served many years ago wasn't what I would want to have as, you know, if I'm a little one, but even at my yeah. age, it was there was just, didn't really, a lot of sugars. So that's, that's a great question. Um, about uh, 10 to 12 years ago, through okay. the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, things really changed drastically in the federal regulations. And so at that point, there, there had been some standards before that, but at that point, um, the we had a requirement put into place that um, all the grain items be uh, whole grain rich. 
um, that um, fruits and that at least a half a cup of fruit or vegetable be part of every meal. Um, the vegetables, uh, you have to offer a range of different vegetables over the course of the week. Um, so not just your, your red orange, but also your, your dark green vegetables and, and all the other vegetable types over the course of the week. Um, there's some sodium restrictions, um, and there are some, some calorie limits over the course of the week. Um, and who changed? Are those, is that federal guidelines? That is federal. Could the yeah. state become stricter if it wanted to? I so expect. we actually... We, we, are we in pretty good shape, from your opinion? We're in pretty yeah. good shape, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, we have... The, the federal government actually did roll back um, a few standards okay. a little bit, um, and we maintained the whole grain rich requirement at a time that the federal government actually rolled that back. Um, we're on a little bit shaky ground um, to the extent that we put in a lot of different requirements, um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the federal government is not real happy about us withholding reimbursement for meals that meet their meal pattern. So um, we could withhold our state funds if we had a stricter meal pattern, but that would be, in some areas they might let us do it, in some areas they wouldn't. Um, so that would have to be something we'd want to do in consultation with them. Um, the other piece of it is a lot of the child nutrition program uh, foods, uh, the, the producers who make those foods are making them to the federal standard. So those sodium restrictions, those whole grain restrictions, the labeling that you need to prove that this item meets those requirements, that's all kind of producers reacting to national requirements. And so, um, if we were to try to do something to like, you know, target sodium even more or do something else, our folks like Erica would have a much harder time shopping. Um, it would be much more difficult for her to purchase the items that she needs to, to meet the meal pattern. Okay. Um, so it's, it's definitely a conversation we can have, um, but there are very strict federal requirements in place. Um, and if you haven't gone to eat school lunch at school in the last 10 years, I would really strongly encourage right. you to do it because it looks very, very different. Right. It is not, you know, it's changed significantly since I was in school. Yeah. Um, I'm, we go out on my team and we're reviewing schools all the time and I'm always happy to eat school meals at school at this That's point. Right. They're, they're good meals um, and I'm really proud of those meals. Um, but yeah, there, there are strict federal requirements um, we couldn't do things like, I do hear sometimes folks ask if we can serve whole milk, um, and it's a federal requirement that we can't serve whole milk. So if we tried to offer whole milk, then again, we'd be you risking us. Unpasteurized or whole milk? No, just fat content. Fat, fat content, thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, so there are some, you know, we, we could, for example, um, Erica was talking about a la carte items, so selling meals outside of the meal pattern. Um, that's that, you know, that additional, uh, slice of pizza or bag of chips or whatever. Um, there are states that are more restrictive about those. We don't have stricter mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. requirements on those. We leave those up to the schools. But that is an area where if you wanted to, you could theoretically do more in that area. Um, we have heard, like Eric was mentioning, a lot of schools um, now this year with Universal Meals moving away from offering a la carte completely. Um, as a result of being able to offer all the meals for free and no longer needing to support their programs uh, with those a la carte purchases. Um, so yes, the, there is a, a strict federal meal pattern and, and almost every other thing that you can think of about the program is, is covered by strict federal regulations. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you, you have about those. Um, so going back to our state laws, um, we do, um, we do require that schools participate, um, and again, that, that exemption process was eliminated this year. We also have a state law that requires um, that summer meals be offered in the highest poverty districts when they're offering summer programming. Um, that's an area you know you you could look at um, whether you know we definitely see fewer summer meals offered than um, or summer meals provided than school year, um, and I think summer is definitely an area for growth. The federal rules around that do make it somewhat challenging um, in that only the highest poverty areas are able to offer open summer meal sites where students can take meals for free. Um, we provide a little bit of state funding um, to support summer meals, um, but that amount has not grown in recent years, so that's something that you could think about um, looking at in the future. Um, we also have a state law that um, 
you know, prior to, to uh, Universal Meals this year that permanently provided state funding to cover the difference between reduced price meals and free meals. So you've got three categories of meals in the federal meals programs. Free meals are um, traditionally served at no cost to the family, and those are available to kids who are under 130%, whose households are under 130% of the federal poverty level. Um, or students who are directly certified, and this is a, a word you're gonna hear a lot, directly certified for free school meals because their household participates in some other means-tested program. Um, and so the biggest program there is Three Squares Vermont, which is known federally as SNAP. So any household who participates in Three Squares Vermont, um, we get that information from DCF, we share it with the school, and the school directly certifies that student for free meals without the household having to submit an application. There are a couple of other categories of direct certification which allow the household to receive free meals without requiring the household to submit an application. And then the other option is for the household to submit that application showing that they make less than 130% of the federal poverty level. That's the free category. The reduced category is um, for students between 130 and 185% of the federal poverty level. And it's called reduced price because traditionally um, the, federal, the federal government doesn't reimburse 40 cents of that meal. And they expect the household, 40 cents for lunch and 30 cents for breakfast. They expect the household to contribute that share. In Vermont for many years, the state has picked up that cost. Um, and it's been frankly a, a fairly nominal amount of money. Um, I think $500,000 is budgeted and we end up spending less than that. Um, but there's still the category. They're still called reduced price students, even though the meals are provided to those kids at no charge. Um, there, right now, are no direct certification processes for, um, for the reduced price category. It's just households submitting an application. As Anor mentioned, the state was just approved for the um, direct certification through Medicaid pilot. That will start um, on July 1st of this year. That will allow us to directly certify two categories of students. So we'll be able to directly certify students for free school meals based on their participation in Medicaid if their Medicaid information shows they're under 130% 100, of federal poverty. And we'll also be able to directly certify a reduced price category of students for those kids between 130 and 185%. And that is brand new, that we've never been able to directly certify that category before. Um, so uh, those are those two categories. And then there's this whole other group that is considered paid. Um, now, the assumption is always, well, these families must be wealthy. But really, all we know about these families is that they have not submitted an application. So we don't have any information showing that they are eligible for free or reduced. Therefore, they're paid. Um, and so those are the, that's what, you know, when we're talking about free, reduced, and paid, that's what we're talking about. Um, I do want to kind of briefly, I guess, um, I'll continue through, through talking about the, the couple of other state laws we have, but then I want to return to that and talk a little bit about the idea of stigma, because uh, things may have changed on, on that front as well um, with regard to what folks remember from many years ago. Um, so we, uh, the state pays for the reduced price share of student meals for breakfast and lunch. We do not pay for the reduced price share of student meals for after school snack. Um, after school snack is a very small program. Um, and you know, compared to the meals we serve for breakfast and lunch. Um, but that is an area where we don't pay it at the state level. Um, this, a number of schools do chip in for that and just cover it for their students. Um, but that is, you know, potentially a, a component to think about there. Um, and then we also have a state law, um, as was referenced earlier, the Local Foods Incentive Grant Program. That's now in its second year, um, and that's managed by my team. Um, we currently have $500,000 appropriated for that. That's a two-tier grant program. The first tier of that grant program is very, is pretty simple. Um, schools do a couple of different things and then they qualify um, for, uh, I believe, 15 cents per meal served um, in the prior year for an additional reimbursement. They're only eligible for that for one year. Once they've received that, they have to move on to tier two if they want to continue to receive the funds. Tier two is much stricter. That is a specific percentage um, local purchasing requirement. They have to purchase a certain amount of their local of their total foods locally. Um, and if they do that and they meet that threshold and they're audited by us, 
um, then they get um, a certain amount of additional per plate uh, reimbursement, um, depending on that percentage. So we're now in year two. We've had a whole bunch of schools who've made it through year one and a small number of schools who've made it through year two to get that year two grant. And then we still have some schools who never applied for year one. They still could if they'd like to in the future. We'll be presenting a full report to you on that um, shortly. I think it's due at the end of the month, but we do have that um, ready potentially to present to you sooner than that. So that's, um, that's a, a state law. And then we also um, provide about $50,000 um, for state equipment grants to school nutrition programs as well. And that's been a, a many, many years um, thing that we have done uh, we also have some additional state funding in the form of state match, which is federally required. Um, and we do, I mentioned, we provide about uh, a small amount of uh, state summer funds as well to support those summer funds programs. So that's what the state does on top of those big federal requirements. Um, I am looking at the clock here. <laughs> um, so I am happy to answer general questions that you have. If, if you don't have general questions, I think I might like to spend a minute talking about stigma. And then maybe if we have some time talking about CEP and provision two and how those work, or I can refer you to the universal meals report from last year to learn about Senator Weeks. One question for uh, the summer Senator programs. You said, yeah. that's okay. yeah. I apologize. Um, you said that some some schools they have a summer program. What what type of programs are you talking about? Yeah. If we so, have a recreation program with the Pullman High School. Yeah. So. Um, Oh, it'll be to take different forms in different places. Um, so if it is a high poverty area, um, USDA calls these area eligible locations, um, then you can have an open meal site um, where you know students show up at, you know, at the library, at a food truck, at a park, um, and, and receive a meal there. Under the normal federal requirements, they have to eat the meal right there. Um, that has been waived for the past few years because of COVID, but that waiver is, is gone. Um, so we're going to have to return to in-person congregate feeding this summer, although the omnibus appropriations bill that Congress passed made, um, added a non-congregate option for rural areas, and we're still waiting to learn how that's going to work. <laughs> um, so that's what it may look like um, in low-income areas. And then if a school has some kind of enrichment activity happening over the summer, um, you know, summer programming, like you're talking about sports camps, whatever, um, they can also offer a program to those students. They can either do that as an open program where, you know, those students go participate in, the, in this open meal site, or it can be a closed enrolled program. And in a closed enrolled program, you can do that in a non-low income area if you base it on the status of the students who are participating in that program. So you can collect applications from them. Uh, you're not allowed to charge, um, so you just need to come up with some funds to cover the cost of those meals served to the So is it through a grant? Would they have to apply for a grant for that? It's, so these are all entitlement programs. Okay. So if, if the program goes through the federal requirements, they sign up with us, they, um, they go through, you know, they, they meet all the paperwork requirements with us, then they go out and try to serve meals. And if they serve a meal that meets those meal pattern requirements, then we reimburse them at a set federal reimbursement rate. Um, so you know they could come in and say, well, we don't know how many minutes we're going to serve. Maybe it'll be 50. And then they come back to us and say, well, actually, we serve 75. We'll reimburse them for all 75 meals. Um, so Great. that's that's how that works. And that rate, that's a set rate. Federal government sets it. You know, of course, the state could add more to it, but there's it's not variable. Thank you. Please. Um, so I guess. Uh, I can just mention um, there was some discussion about stigma, and I just want to mention that um, you know, depending on when you went to school, things things have changed over many years with child nutrition programs and school meals. Um, and some folks may remember that the free kids got a different colored ticket or a token, or you know, that's called overt identification, and that is strictly prohibited in the school meals programs at this point. So if you're thinking that that's what's happening and that's what you know when we're talking about stigma, that that isn't happening. Um, it is, you know, the, the school meals program makes every effort to make that information private. That's something that my team reviews when we go out and review. If we see any violation of that, we're very strict about that. So, you know, to the extent that when a child goes through the point of service, the, the computer may, um, you know, they may scan their, their card or enter a PIN number, and it may pop up with a fake balance. 
just to try and provide that anonymity and make sure that there's no way for family or for kids in line to tell or even the, the person at the point of sale to tell what's going on there. But um, I think you heard you know, discussion of, of a la carte or only the kids. Um, the kids who are in line are, are the ones who are uh, eligible for free meals and everybody else brings their meals from home. Um, a la carte sales is a really good example where the, the free and reduced price kids are the ones who are going through and taking that federally required reimbursable meal. And they have to take the fruit or vegetable in order for it to be considered reimbursable. The kids who are paid can, you know, buy whatever they want uh, from their um, if their school is offering a la carte sales, um, and that's just paid for by their household. So maybe they just buy a slice of pizza, and they don't have to take the fruit or vegetable. So that's that's a lot more subtle. Um, nobody is overtly labeling the, those kids as free or reduced, um, and certainly, you know, that's. That's, that's already prohibited in the federal laws. It's already something that we do um, to make sure it doesn't happen. When you're hearing stigma, those, are, those other sources of stigma are, are what we're talking about. Um, and they're a little bit more difficult to, to specifically outlaw because it's not something the school is specifically doing. So, committee, questions? Again, we're just jumping into this. This group will be back with the final report in weeks to come. I just wanted you to be able to provide us with a little introduction and, and some of the work that you do. Yeah. So I would really encourage you to go back and read the Universal Meals report that yep. we published last year. I think we may have submitted that as part of our, our testimony today. That will really give you the basis of kind of what we were talking about going into this um, and the problems that we were trying to you know, make sure that you fully understood so that when you're writing legislation, you can address all of those issues. Um, it's, it's complex. We tried to break it down um, as much as possible, um, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you all have about that as you're um, going through. But that's really the starting place, um, and then we'll come back to you with that report about how this is going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Great. Committee, uh, five minutes. Uh, just take a stretch, bathroom break. We'll come back, and we'll jump into what we're con con calling part one, really, of trying to understand what it's like to be uh, educated here in the state of Vermont. And then we'll move on to um, school safety and financial literacy. Uh, welcome back to Senate Education. Uh, today is January 11th, 2.40 in the afternoon. We have with us, or we are about to have with us, I believe Dr. Boucher and uh, Ms. Gorham and we'll wait for them to arrive. Dr. Boucher, Ms. Gorham, how are you both? Hello, Mr. Chair, I'm great. It's nice to see you. Good to see the two of you. We really appreciate you being with us. You are kicking off our conversations, trying to understand and help new committee members and returning committee members and others watching really what a Vermont education looks like. Uh, we are going to hear from teachers, students, uh, other school personnel, and we thought we would kick it off by just getting an overview, and I see that you have this Vermont assessment results uh, document for us. Thanks for sending it along, and thank you, Hayden, for printing it. Uh, to kind of give us a, a, a snapshot of testing and test scores, how they work, what we should be looking for. Uh, Vermont historically generally is celebrated as a, a state that uh, does a good job, but we also know there are areas where we can improve. And one most recently is the work that this committee did on literacy. So. With that, I am going to hand it over to the two of you, and, and I would ask a couple of things just to make sure that are included in your presentation. One, just tests in general. Uh, a little bit of, hey, this is this is uh, this is good, reliable information. This is what parts that you might want to take with a grain of salt. This is what we're trying to evaluate. This is what you're really seeing. Uh, that would be very helpful. And then I would also keep in mind as you're going through other groups, organizations, people that we should talk to that can help give us this sort of baseline of what uh, Vermont education is. So with that, 
the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you, Mr. Chair. So for the record, my name is Heather Boucher and I am the Deputy Secretary for Education. I wanted to start by um, expressing my um, disappointment that I couldn't meet you all yesterday in person. Um, I'd really been hoping to do that. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have furry children, but I have a very um, doted upon furry child who actually potentially has a stomach obstruction because of something that he's eaten. And so I was tasked with watching him all day yesterday. He seems to be doing well, he's a dog. Um, so anyway, that's, that's <laughs> um, why I couldn't see you in person and I do apologize. Um, I am here joined with um, Amanda Gorham, Dr. Amanda Gorham, who is our uh, brand new, although she's been in um, the agency for um, several years now, she is our uh, brand new division director-ish, um, a couple months now, right, Amanda, um, of our um, division of data management and research, um, and you may have heard about um, that division uh, when Secretary French uh, testified yesterday, I believe. Um, so uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this she is the new Wendy Geller, um, just to um, keep things um, in perspective of sort of the movement within um, positions in our agency. Um, so we are, um, I think, you know, that's a great question uh, that the committee is, is posing and, and getting answers on. Um, we're very happy to um, uh, help um, assist committee members in understanding the answers. I would say plural to uh, the question of what does our education system look like? How are students doing? And all related questions um, thereupon. We are, as Mr. Chair said, going to focus today on um, just some broad sweeps of how our students are doing in terms of our latest, um, at this point, their preliminary um, state assessment data. And Dr. Gorham will get into some of those details about um, the different kinds of testing that we do um, that might actually address uh, the point that you had brought up, uh, Mr. Chair. So I'm going to um, pipe down and let Amanda um, take it away. And then I will also be perhaps piping back in um, throughout um, to um, provide some additional context or if there's a point that I think would be really helpful for uh, the committee to um, know. And then of course we'll um, throughout and at the end be um, very interested in questions. Great. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. Boucher. And Dr. Gorham, I should mention that uh, our committee assistant also put in our folders this preliminary 2022 statewide assessment results, just so you know that we have that as well in front of us. So with that, uh, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to share a PowerPoint presentation on the screen. Um, so I'm Great. just going to take a moment to um, to acclimate myself here. Oh, I cannot share my screen. <laughs> Maybe I can now. I believe you can. Yeah. I can now. Okay, we're in good shape. All right. All right. So um, I'm gonna take you through um, some results from the 2022 school year. Um, we'll discuss uh, some of the interpretations of those results, including limitations and comparability. Um, and then we'll wrap up with uh, what we believe we can learn from uh, a year of testing. So first I will note that this presentation is going to cover um, the state assessments that were administered during uh, 2022. So we have the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium provided assessments of ELA and math. We have the Vermont Science Assessment, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the VTSA. And we also have the National Assessment of Educational Progress or the NAEP Assessment in reading and math, which was administered um, across the state as well. 
I do want to note here that this is not like a comprehensive overview of the assessment program that the state administers. We do also have the um, assessment of English language proficiency, which is administered to our English learners. Uh, there's an alternate assessment. And of course, our districts and schools administer various local assessments in addition to these assessments to better understand student achievement um, at different points throughout the school year and for different purposes. So this is sort of just a, a limited scope um, of, of what you might see uh, happen throughout a year. Amanda? Yes. Just wanted to clarify, um, as, as new committee members are probably already learning, we are very deep in acronym land in education. And so ELA uh, is English language arts. So it is, it is what most um, folks um, in the world think of as English, um, just so you know. It's, it's a broad spectrum of reading, writing, comprehension, um, all those kinds of things. But when you see ELA, that's what it, what it means is kind of English for the rest of us. Would you agree, Amanda? Yeah, yep. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right, so moving along here. Just a quick note on using assessment results. Um, you know, we, we want to acknowledge that assessments are one of many tools that we can use um, to, to learn certain things uh, and limited things. You know, there isn't one assessment that, that tells us everything about everything. Um, we take great care in ensuring that results from these assessments are used appropriately, and, in, and we also encourage appropriate use of these assessment results. Um, and lastly here, I'll note that the results from state and national assessments, like the ones presented here, are intended to inform decisions at the state, district, and school level, uh, and they capture learning that has already taken place. So they're not uh, assessments that are given during the course of learning and can immediately be used to inform instruction. These are more um, final or summative measures here that we're reporting on. Uh, quickly, so that you know the nature of results that are being presented here today, for our state assessments of ELA, math, and science, we're uh, reporting preliminary results. That's what you would see in the press release that came out yesterday. Um, so these results are not official. They are not final. What makes um, them, or, uh, uh, Dr. Gorham, what makes them official? Mm -hmm. Great question. So we would consider the results official when they have been matched up with our enrollment records. Um, so right now they have not been matched with our um, with our data collections for enrollment. And so um, we're considering these preliminary. The scores that each student has, has earned do not change, but where those students are reported to could theoretically change depending on where they were enrolled during different times of the test window. Um, so we hold these as preliminary. And then once the assessment results have been matched with um, our enrollment records, they'll be published in the annual snapshot, which we anticipate to be published later this winter. And that's when more detailed results such as school and district level results will become publicly available. Thank you. Of course, of course. Um, the, the National of, um, uh, Assessment of Educational Progress or the NAEP, those results are, have already been released uh, publicly. They are official. They are publicly available on NCES's website. Um, and so we will pre be presenting on official results for that assessment. Uh, and here we dive in. So what we're showing here is for our English language arts assessment uh, provided through Smarter Balance last year, um, we are showing the percent of students who were proficient or above at each grade level. So you'll see here numbers hovering somewhere between 40 and, and 50. Um, and something that I wanna point out here is that um, when we say proficient, Right, we are not talking about a measure that has been defined by a test vendor or anyone outside of Vermont. What we're looking at is a standard that has been set by Vermont educators. And that standard um, qualifies what a student must know and be able to do to be considered proficient. That's decided by our Vermont educators through something called a stand standard setting study. Um, and so what we're seeing here, kind of to put it into context, is that 41% of our grade three students um, achieved in a way that our Vermont educators would consider to be proficient um, minimally um, on so that Dr. assessment. Bowen, what then can the remaining third graders not do? 
Well, there's right. We assess a variety of standards. And right. so you mean, that yeah. the answer to that question would vary depending on the student. It, the student could be, um, you know, I think that if we um, if we describe the assessments in more detail, it might be um, a little easier to understand. Okay. So our English language proficiency assessment has different targets that we are assessing, right? We have listening, we have reading, we have writing for examples. And within that there's different standards that students are being assessed on. And so um, we can't really say that if a student is not proficient, they're not uh, proficient at listening or they haven't met this specific content standard. It's going to vary across students. Um, mm -hmm. what, and, and so that's when we kind of have to take that deeper dive into the assessment data and also look at other measures to understand what that percentage of students um, could, be, uh, could be working on to gain proficiency. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, please, uh, Senator Hashim. Um, Dr. Goyma, I was wondering if you could just share how these results compare uh, to the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so we can uh, we can actually use the NAEP uh, to look at results across the nation. Um, our smarter balanced assessments of ELA math and our science assessment are state specific. So what we can't really compare to other states with those assessments because they're based on our state standards and our teachers uh, and educators expectations of proficiency. But the NAEP really is like the national standard. Um, and so later in this presentation, we will look at Vermont compared to the nation. Um, and so we'll, we'll get to that in just a few more slides. Um, but for this assessment, this, this assessment um, provided by Smarter Balance and the Vermont Science Assessment are really intended to show us um, a, a state specific perspective. Thank So the next uh, graph that I will show you is our math assessment results, the preliminary results from 2022. And what you can visually see here is sort of a, a, a decline in percent proficient as we advance in the grade levels, um, grade three being the highest percent of students uh, being proficient, um, and then kind of dropping down from there all the way to 26% in grade nine. Um, you know, this is this is something that um, I think that the nature of these results can be seen in other years. We don't recommend comparing these results to other years, but I think the nature of the performance that we see um, for math is something that we have seen before um, in Vermont. So I think what would be just uh, so I don't forget it is to have you back in uh, next week to. to pull this apart a little bit. This I, I appreciate what we're doing today, uh, but I, I would like to get a sense of the things that perhaps our eighth graders, you know, that, that's, you know, over 70% of eighth graders aren't getting something. And so either come back in with sample tests, sample, you know, some examples, because we are, like you, looking to make improvements on all this. So as much information as we can get uh, our, in our, our heads around, uh, the better. Great. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, and just presenting this uh, performance levels for science here, uh, for percent proficient, we, can, uh, we administer our science assessment in only three grade levels, grades five, eight, and 11. Um, and the assessment is designed to um, assess uh, sort of a broad range of standards so that we're not just capturing grade eight science, but we're kind of get capturing standards that a student experiences across uh, the grades in between. Um, and so, you know, it can be a little bit challenging to interpret these results, I think, because we're not looking at one year after the next. Um, but we can see that, you know, we have between about 30 and 40% and of students across grade levels uh, reaching at least proficiency on the science assessment. So I've taken these results um, by subject and clustered them here together. Um, and, and I've done this because I think it really highlights the difference between ELA and math as the grade levels advance. 
Um, so you can see that gap between ELA and math proficiency widening um, as you advance in the grade levels. It also highlights the uh, difference for grades five and eight between ELA and science. So just to clarify, because um, it can be hard to digest these more complicated um, slides. So the first piece about um, a stronger um, gap between English and math is if you can across over time over grade is if you compare the um, like the um, distance between the green and blue um, bars. So you can see that that's actually um, it's really not statistically significant in grade three and then by grade nine um, you're comparing 45 percent proficient to 26 percent proficient. Just to clarify. Thank you Heather. Can I ask a yes, question? please. Uh, just out of curiosity, how come there are, for example, between grade six and then seven, and then also grade nine, there's no proficiency for science? That's a great question. Thank you. So, science is only the science assessment is only administered in grades five, grade eight, and grade eleven. So, you won't see a measure for science in grades three, four, six, seven, or nine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Part of that, just to follow up, um, is that the science assessment is a bit more complex. So it actually has performance tasks. Students are actually doing things um, as opposed to just answering questions. Um, and obviously in math, they're making calculations and things like that. But part of the reason is um, that those assessments are, are different. Um, the, the, what they're assessing are um, a a combination of performance and um, typical types of assessment questions. The other thing um, in our state plan, we wanted to, we're trying to balance um, the work that it takes to actually um, do the assessment um, in the classrooms, like in the schools with instructing students. And so that also factors in because um, it does take time away from classroom, from um, instruction uh, when we are doing assessments. Thank you, Heather. Okay, so, so I'm gonna transition into um, the uh, NAEP results. Uh, so again, this is an assessment that is administered nationally. Um, and so this assessment does allow us to look at Vermont versus the nation. Um, and so we're presenting here reading first, and it's a similar measure, percent proficient or higher. And um, there are two bars uh, for each grade level here. So the light green bar is for Vermont, and that is the percent of students who scored proficient or above in 2022 for Vermont. And we're comparing that to the darker green bar, which is the national public for 2022. So that's students in other public schools in the nation. Um, and um, I thought, you know, as we're going through this slide, someone might ask, well, where was Vermont in 2019 then? Um, and so I have added this little diamond here to indicate where performance was for Vermont in 2019, um, in, in case that's something that someone is curious about. Um, we can kind of cover it on the same slide. So um, things I'd like to mention about this, uh, this graph, only the grade eight difference uh, between Vermont and the nation is statistically significant. Um, so that means that even though 34% of Vermonters uh, scored proficient or above and 32% uh, percent of the, the national public scored proficient or above, so there is a 2% difference there, but that difference is not statistically significant. It could just be due to chance. Uh, with grade eight, this difference between 34% and 29% is statistically significant. It is not likely just due to chance. And so we can say that Vermont in 2022 outperformed the nation in grade eight math. I'm sorry, reading, in grade eight reading. Well, I'm not sure if I would agree with that. Well, let me tell you my concern. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think Vermont has as many English as a second language students as let's say some other states. We don't see that those numbers in this state yet. I, I could be wrong, but it doesn't seem exactly apples to apples to me. Is, would you agree or disagree with that? 
I would slightly disagree, Mr. Chair, because this is the national sample, they um, deploy a very sophisticated statistical sampling method. So they actually would, um, they are including a proportional number of ELA students um, to actually be able to make, uh, for each state to actually be able to make um, these comparisons. So for instance, typically what they would do would um, be to weight the results with certain coefficients. I'm getting very technical here. Um, no, so true. that so that they so that they actually are apples to apples and not mm -hmm. apples to oranges. But it's a great thought and a great question. No, I appreciate I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Tell me if you would agree I, I or think, disagree with this. I mean, those numbers, 70% of kids in the United States of America in eighth grade are not proficient in reading. I mean, to me, that I, I'm that that is is startling. Uh, and I think most Americans would agree, you know, we, we need to do something about that. We would agree. And it's what it's, okay. it's we actually really um, are thrilled to get the opportunity to talk about these assessment results, very frankly, um, with the committee, because we do think it is time for us to be thinking about um, not only nationally, but how can we improve um, in terms of our state? You know, so would it, be, it would be great, just one last piece, it'd be great like if yeah. we had, you know, 60% in Vermont proficient um, compared to the national average. So yes, we're higher, yeah. but we're not amazingly higher. Right. Thank you, Chair. To your point, I think, what you may have been getting at a little bit is sort of demographic, um, you know, what, what we look like demographically um, in Vermont versus the country. And I was wondering if we might be able to get a comparison to our New England neighbors at some point. That just might be interesting to see Vermont versus Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Hampshire, et cetera. It's a great idea. Can we get that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'd be happy to come back and present more on NAEP and the comparisons to right. other states and across the nation, um, or just to provide materials yeah. that are more descriptive. Uh, do our Canadian neighbors uh, offer something, a similar test or the same test? Um, I'm less familiar. Um, Sorry, I'm, in, okay. I'm less familiar okay. with fine. what theirs would be. I would assume they okay. do something, but we wouldn't be able to compare either. That's fine. Truly. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to advance here to look at math. Um, and again, this is the official 2022 NAEP results for math. Uh, similar layout with the graph here. So if we focus on just the bars, we are looking at Vermont in 2022 with the light blue and the national public average for the dark blue bar here. Um, and, and we are seeing some very slight differences here between the two bars, but neither of these differences are statistically significant. So what we can interpret is that for mathematics in grade four and grade eight, we were performing similar to the nation. Um, in 2022. You can see here from these diamond shapes that indicate 2019 performance that there has been a dip since 2019 uh, for Vermont. Um, so that's something that we can note there. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about comparing to previous years in a few slides. Um, but if that brings up that curiosity for you, um, performance was a bit different um, in 2019. Okay, and so here we are um, clustering some results together once again. And, and again, I think that, you know, showing um, reading is green, math is blue, um, as I've tried to keep consistent through the presentation. Um, and this is, uh, on this side, we have Vermont. And on this side, NP stands for national public. So that's the national uh, population of public school students that participated in the assessment. Um, I think this shows the difference between reading and math achievement within the grade levels. Um, so, you know, for grade four, it looks pretty, pretty similar, but for grade eight, we start to see a gap there. Um, same thing for, um, for the nation, um, but just a, a bit smaller. So um, same information, but just a little bit of a different way to present it. Okay, so we're going to take a break from graphs for a couple slides. Heather, did you need to say something? 
yes, I apologize. I had been muted because I had barking in my background. Um, I also, if you go back to that slide, and you'll recall that we also had with the state level data for 2022, the same, if we look at um, the breakdown by grade, that we started to see that, um, that same pattern in terms of um, perhaps doing a little better or a lot better in the early grades for math and then by um, the middle to high school years um, really declining in terms of our own um, proficiency scores. So we have a similar pattern with national, with our comparison to national and with our own SBAC scores is the point I'm trying to make here. Thank you, Heather. Okay, now a break from graphs. Um, so I want to acknowledge some limitations here. Um, first, I will note that the NAEP assessment is administered pretty differently than our state uh, summative assessments, uh, smarter balance in the Vermont science assessment. Uh, with NAEP, there are uh, hired assessment coordinators that come in to the schools with machines that are provided to the schools to administer these assessments. Um, so there is some control over how standardized uh, and typical the administration can be. Um, and that is, you know, that kind of led NAEP to be able to make these cross year comparisons um, with the 2022 results. Uh, for our Smarter Balance and Vermont Science assessments that were administered here within the state, um, First, I want to acknowledge that the results have not been matched to enrollment. We talked about that earlier. Um, so these are preliminary. Um, but uh, we also have this point about participation in the assessments. Um, 2022 was still, uh, for us, we still consider that a pandemic year for our assessments. Um, we know that in 2021, the year prior, participation, especially for historically marginalized groups of students, uh, the participation was quite a bit lower. Uh, than it typically is. And we believe that we may see a similar trend in 2022, um, but we don't have official data on that yet. So the results that we are looking at right now, we are not sure how those results should be interpreted given participation of students. So whenever we're looking at these aggregate results, we wanna remind ourselves that it might not be uh, all students that are contributing to these, these average scores or these proficiency levels that we're interpreting, uh, there could be a lower percentage of say students with disabilities participating in the assessment during the year. Um, and so we want to acknowledge that. Um, and we also want to acknowledge that the pandemic conditions likely impacted administration of the assessments. Um, we went into detail about that in the press release that you all have with you. Um, but we do know that, you know, with educators being responsible for administering these assessments um, and there being educator uh, staffing shortages and also resources being pulled in different directions, um, you know, things were certainly not typical uh, in 2022 as we saw in 2021. Um, and I see, I see a hand raised. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Uh, just curious, uh, do you have any kind of uh, thumbnail uh, sketch on what the participation percentage was? You, you alluded that it was it was smaller, but doesn't really say anything. Was it twenty percent smaller, fifty percent smaller than uh, twenty nineteen? Yeah, I don't have the 2021 numbers on hand for participation, um, and I apologize for not having that with me. And for 2022, we we can't compute that until we have finalized enrollment numbers. Um, so that's something that we would be happy to you know to provide when we um, have it available. Um, I can I can uh, pull up the 2021 numbers though and and share those. Um, I'll make a note of it. Sure. I will note just as a follow-up to that question that uh, we are required um, through federal uh, legislation to have an overall 95% participation rate in our state assessments. Um, prior to COVID, we would typically, I think, be fine with that. There have always been um, sometimes from year to year certain districts or schools that struggle for whatever reason to make um, to make those that um, 95% um, benchmark. But it all, it, we tended to do quite well overall um, as a state in that. And so I think that's the other piece of this is really trying to match to our student enrollment so we can have a much better sense of like, are there areas where we can really provide some supports around getting, around ensuring that um, students are participating. Um, 
in the assessments. As you can see, it's really critical information for us to have as a state, and we would argue it's critical for parents to know this um, with their own students as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heather. Okay, so the next couple of slides, I'll be talking about comparability of results across years. I'm gonna start with our state assessments of ELA math and science. Um, and I'm going to note that, you know, as an agency, we're not recommending comparing 2021, 2021 results uh, to any other year, including 2022. Uh, we had great difficulty in administering assessments during 2021, uh, during that school year. Um, and, and as I already had suggested, we saw lower and uneven participation rates across all students and across subgroups of students. Um, and that makes interpreting the aggregate level results really challenging. Um, as I had said, you know, if we're looking at a uh, proficiency or a percent proficiency or above uh, for all students, we might be uh, interpreting that as all students when in fact it may mean um, all students except for a good number of English learners or a good number of students with disabilities. Um, and those are the students that these assessments are meant to serve. And so we really wanna be careful um, in our interpretations given those participation rates. Um, I also wanted to note here that the 2022 administration was influenced by pandemic related challenges. Um, and because of that influence and that impact on a standard assessment administration, uh, we don't feel that the administration of the assessment was typical. Um, and so we uh, do not feel that we should be comparing the results to previous years, especially prior to the pandemic. So um, for example, in 2019, we had a very standardized administration of the assessment that was very typical. Um, and in 2022, we had an administration of an assessment where a lot of schools were trying to make it work uh, with, with staffing issues and with, um, with resources that were stretched a little thin and um, with, uh, with lower participation rates uh, from, uh, from some students still uh, lingering from the 2021 school year. Um, and we also had you know, lingering effects of, of an interrupted school year from 2021 um, impacting uh, students as well. Um, we don't want to ignore the social emotional piece as well um, with students. You know, uh, the, the, the emotional state of students prior to the pandemic was very different than it was in 2021 and 2022. Um, so um, we are a little bit challenged in interpreting the results from 2022 at the aggregate level, um, but we do wanna reinforce that um, making comparisons across years with this particular data is really discouraged. NAEP, on the other hand, um, has published comparisons between 2022 and 2019 uh, publicly. Um, and I talked a little bit before about how the administration of the NAEP is, is different in nature than the administration of our uh, state assessments. And so um, they have come to the conclusion that it is okay for that assessment to make those comparisons. Nationally, the scores have declined since 2019 uh, as evidenced by NAEP. Um, scores in Vermont also declined since 2019. However, we can't really attribute that solely to the pandemic uh, or the conditions of the pandemic, because what we know is that scores on NAEP have been generally declining for over a decade. Um, I can visually show you that here. Um, and so these, uh, it, Overall, these lines are showing you how participation uh, has changed over the years for about the past decade. I will uh, just note that NAEP is administered every other year, not every year. So that's why you're seeing only a few, uh, a few years here. Um, and I'm going to um, zoom in a bit here. Okay, so I've kind of gotten rid of the title on the slide so you can see this a little bit easier perhaps. Um, but what we can see is kind of this general trend that's that's coming down to a decline here. And, and if you stop at 2019 uh, and don't focus on just the difference between 2019 and 2022, which is very apparent, um, you can see that the scores were kind of trending down over time. So because that trend existed before the pandemic, we can't say that a decline in scores between 2019 and 2022 is solely due to the conditions of the COVID-19 pandemic. Although we might be able to say um, that it exacerbated it. And I think that's what's important because 
those lines do have what we would say is a is a deeper slope on average. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a challenging place for us to be because we don't have a treatment and control group. <laughs> um, you know, um, but yes, Heather, it, it definitely is um, a steeper slope at that point and uh, more information would be able to certainly tell us more. And so we can bring it back up to the top where we've suggested that, you know, more measures is better. Yeah, and I think what um, what we're trying to communicate just to clarify a little more, well, Amanda and I jumped into a nerdy, um, research issue and I apologize because you can tell that that's really both of our bailiwicks. <laughs> what I think the point that we're trying to make here is that um, it isn't as though things were wonderful and then the pandemic happened and we suddenly took a nosedive that there has been um, this long-standing um, I would say kind of erosion of our performance um, in the past several years um, on our national tests. Um, looking here at fourth and eighth grade. Um, so it's important for us to keep that in mind. Thank you, Heather, absolutely. So the final slide that I'll present here is what can we learn? So having looked at all of this information, what can we take away? Um, and firstly, I wanna to point to participation on these assessments. Uh, we really need to be focusing on participation, especially for our students in historically marginalized uh, populations. So that's students with disabilities, English learners, students living in poverty, and uh, there are a few other uh, classifications of students that come into this historically marginalized student group. Um, that we, that we have established and report on. Um, because participation has been lower for all students and across these subgroups, we are, um, we are not able to report out on these results and interpret them in the ways that we would like to. You know, some of the power of these results has been taken away. Um, and so we really need to be focusing on participation so that we can make full use of these assessment results and so that the purpose of the assessment can be fully realized. Um, to, to, you know, to summarize some of the results that we've seen, Vermont has seen a decline in the percentage of students achieving proficiency since before the pandemic, which is evidenced by our national assessment results with the NAEP. Um, again, you know, there is a limitation to that assessment uh, results were or scores were declining uh, prior to the pandemic. So we'll just note that as a caveat. Um, and, and I do want to point out here that um, you know, our, our recovery efforts as a state are focused on building an education system that our students and communities need. Um, so, so really our focus is not on returning to 2019 and student performance in 2019, um, as Heather has already described. We're really focusing on building out an education system and going above and beyond that to meet the needs of our students and community um, as we move forward. Um, and that does conclude the presentation for this afternoon. So thank you both. Uh, Dr. Gorham, uh, Hayden, we'll reach out to you about a time next week while it's still fresh with us to come in to talk. As Senator Gulick uh, mentioned, let's compare ourselves to the New England states. Let's also get a sense of what are these, what are these questions, what do these tests look like so we can really understand what students know and do not know. And then I would also say we're going to look to all of you also to help us with some solutions. I mean, we started with literacy two years ago, and, and that bill is now in the works, but there might be more that we need to do. But I'm really interested in are there things that this committee and the legislature can do around math? Uh, and then, you know, just other ideas from all of you so that in 10 years we can look back and say, all right, this committee sort of did some work that laid the groundwork, so we're now at got closer to hopefully 60 70 80 you know percent of our students are reading and writing uh at grade level and are proficient in, in math um that sound? mr chair thank you i appreciate that um I, I would like to note just briefly um, that uh, we can certainly look at the assessment that was administered in 2022, but I do want to note that we are administering a new assessment starting this year, um, and so um, this conversation may be one that, you know, we revisit um, 
uh, later on as well as we look at what the new assessment looks like and what proficiency looks like on that assessment as well. Senator Weeks, your hand is up, I'm told. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just a question. The last bullet on the last slide seems to imply that the, um, the uh, needs of our education system uh, aren't necessarily reflected in standardized tests. Is that, is that kind of the, you know, what's written between the lines there? I, so I, I, I understand the pre-pandemic comparison, but there's something that seems to be more in that sentence than that's fully written. Okay. Um, I think that our st state assessments, uh, they do serve the purpose that they're designed for, and that is to uh, inform policy and supports and services uh, for our students. Um, I think that, you know, this sentence really is, is intended to suggest that we, uh, as, as a state, and, and how we're interpreting the res these results, we do not intend to uh, try to determine how to get our performance back to where it was in 2019. Our intention is to figure out how to move forward and, and surpass that performance. Right, but does the standardized testing reflect the goals, again, using your words, that the students and the communities need? I believe it does. Um, I believe that our previous assessment did that, and I believe that the new assessment that we're rolling out really does reflect it. It's informed by Vermont educators, um, and we've been really thoughtful in the implementation. Okay, thank you. Senator Gulick. I'm just wondering, um, as we look at these test scores, and I, you know, they're a little bit concerning, um, for sure, but everything that happens in education has to be seen in a broader context of society, uh, what's going on in our in our country, in the, in the world, et cetera. Um, I am wondering if at some point we can unpack some of those ideas that actually might be within our purview in this committee and certainly here in the legislature. Such as? Such as um, money going to public schools versus private schools. I mean, private schools aren't on this, on this, in this, in this graph. They're, it's not part of these results, but I'd be really curious to know. If their um, scores are better. Yeah, and what, what does that mean? Um, so, I mean, obviously I could list a whole yeah. bunch of things, yeah. but um, poverty, mental health, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, it certainly would be interesting to see if independent school test scores are better, if they're worse where they are, and without a doubt, poverty, nutrition, all of those things are huge. I feel like though as a state, we, we have to get, we have to look at these in some way and say, all right, let's say, let's say it's not 70% of kids. Let's say it's 50% or even 40%. It seems to me like there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to support teachers who are mm -hmm. in the classroom uh, and to help those kids come to class prepared. For sure, yeah, please, Senator Booth. Thank you, Chair. Another elephant in the room might be, for example, you know, if you look at the starting in 2013, cell phone use, um, mm -hmm. social media use, um, the amount of hours, screen hours that our students are um, engaging in, especially outside of school. So, interesting. I know this, yeah. is, this is big, but it, it's very it's interesting. Big, but it's very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, along Senator Gulick's questions, if there is research that any of you have that you might be able to bring to the table around these kinds of things, uh, it would certainly help inform our decisions, some of which are certainly in our control, some of which, of course, uh, aren't, but I, I think they're all legitimate. Yeah. Okay. Anything else uh, at this point? I just wanted to thank the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We um, are very eager to, um, we are eager to present these preliminary results and we're very eager to dig into these and, and really have um, some concerted discussions um, with, with several stakeholders um, around um, our pattern of findings. And um, we really welcome that that work and we're excited about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I believe we have Secretary French who will be, might be in the waiting room? Who's at the end of the hallway? He's at the end of the hallway, all right, thank you, all right. So we'll come in in just a couple minutes. We'll just take a couple minutes, quick stretch, and Secretary French will join us at 3.30. Thanks everybody.
Welcome back to uh, Senate Education 332 on Wednesday, January 11th. We're now shifting to school safety uh, policy initiative being brought to us by our very own Secretary French. So welcome, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Dan French, Secretary of Education. Um, I've got a several page outline of this um, topic, uh, just to follow up on yesterday's sort of brief introduction to this topic. Mm -hmm. It's one uh, we think is an important initiative. Uh, By the way, do we give you a smaller chair as just to as an intimidation <laughs> tactic? It just, I don't know. I, I, don't I, know. I, I yeah. kind of yeah. shuffled yeah. it a little bit. I was wondering. That's fine. Um, okay. Um, Please. I don't know if I couldn't think yesterday. I spent the bulk of my adult life in school board meetings, uh, which is a shame, really. But uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but I'm used to any manner of provisioning seats and positions. Yeah, right. And sure. Of course. So I'm pretty flexible in that regard. Um, so this this is an important topic, uh, yeah. obviously nationally and statewide, and um, we've been working on it inside the administration, and uh, we'd like to uh, recommend a policy initiative in this area uh, to strengthen our uh, statutory framework uh, around school safety. Um, and I'll just pause there for a minute. Just on the way of introduction, we were talking, I think, yesterday in the introduction about statute versus regulation. And it's sort of a, I call it a nested bowl effect. So what the agency does administratively is driven by what you enact in law. And then, uh, like all agencies, we then create regulations and rules to more specifically implement uh, what's required in law, provide further specificity, and so forth. So last session, um, the legislature directed the agency to create new standards, new regulations in the area of what we call district quality standards. Uh, we had made the argument, it really emerged as part of the pupil waiting conversation. We talked briefly about that major policy reform. So at one point when I was testifying, I think it was in the House Ways and Means Committee, um, in the very early in that process, someone said, well, if we, if we give these additional weights to a district, what do we have as assurance that they're actually going to take that capacity and make investments in areas that we'd like to see them improve? And I said, that's a great question. We really need to strengthen our regulations in some areas, key areas. And what we've identified as district quality standards, and that's something we're working on I can talk more about. In that law, it was Act 172, you, you directed us to create district quality standards, and you also named the three sort of domains, if you will, where we create standards. Those three areas are business operations. So we're talking about sort of the back office functions of school districts, business operations, facilities management, safety, and school board governance. So we started working on that at the direction of the General Assembly. We we're working on this issue of facilities maintenance and safety regulations. And when we're working on that, one of the questions we surface very early in those conversations is, you know, to what extent is the statutory framework sufficient for us to do this regulatory work? And we identified pretty quickly with school safety that um, it wasn't sufficient. So inside our own work group this summer, we were like, it, it wasn't, you know, the point I'm making is it wasn't so much a reaction to events that are happening nationally or what have you with Vivaldi. It was just, we were working on a regulatory construct and we asked the question right up front, do we have sufficient statutory protection or direction as we're developing these regulations? And we concluded we do not. Essentially, many of the regulations or the statutory language around school safety is worded in the form of recommendations, not requirements. So the big theme here is that we're bringing forward the idea that we think it's time to make these things requirements. So what are these things? Uh, they're not new things. They're things uh, in the background paragraph of the memo. These are things that were identified through the work of a school safety advisory group that the General Assembly formed in 2018. Uh, we can share that report with you that they did, but it's basically comprised of all the different stakeholders that are involved and who have technical expertise in school safety, like Department of Public Safety and so forth. Uh, they surfaced a series of recommendations. It is these recommendations that we are bringing forward as a recommendations translated now into requirements. That, that's the policy su suggestion here. So there's three areas of recommendations. Um, that this group identified. One is this idea of um, options-based response drills. Um, we can talk more in detail. I sort of give you some bullets on what's in there. There's there's a alphabet soup of acronyms there for you to chew on just to get you acclimated to some of those. Um, 
and all, all hazards emergency operations plans. So that's number two. Um, all hazards, that's, as I think I mentioned yesterday, it's sort of unique to each school district. They, you know, if you have a dam in your backyard, that, that gets addressed in your all hazards plan. If you don't have a dam, you don't address that in your plan. Um, so number one, drills. Number two, plan. Uh, three, policy on access control. This is the physical, physical security buildings. Um, this has changed over the years. I can remember when I was superintendent in Manchester, I think it was around 2007, Manchester and Senator, uh, you might remember, um, Manchester MEMS was going through a, 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 an upgrade in their facilities and the school was building a new front entrance, which is not an unusual innovation. I was at Winneski today and they're touring their new facility. Um, that's one of the things most schools address when they're doing facility upgrades right now is, is improving the front access to their buildings, you know, the perimeter security. But at that time, this was 2007, even then it was sort of controversial inside of Manchester as a representative community, uh, the tension around should we lock our school doors all the time? What about community feel and access to the building? We'd like to be able to come into the building anytime we want. And that was a uh, conversation the community had to adjudicate basically through the creation of a visitor control policy. And we worked through that. Uh, even in 2007, most of the parents ended up being very supportive of be creating a more secure facility. But I can remember that conversation starting out in 2007, like we're concerned about not being able to come into the building anytime we want. Um, but times have changed. And uh, we're at that point now with this number three uh, that we think uh, it should be a requirement that all school facilities are secured during the day. So. Um, again, requirement number four is sort of the more, uh, I would say, modern evolution of where we've been in a lot of this training and the technical support, this idea of a behavior threat assessment team. Uh, this is the sort of the latest innovation. The last two years, really, uh, this is work that's come out nationally. It's work we've been uh, deploying to the Vermont School Safety Center across the state. Uh, this is well understood by our school districts um, that they need to um, organize themselves in a manner that allows them to assess the threats of the context that they're in, but importantly, um, use that assessment as a means of deploying additional resources and providing supports to students and families. Um, so anyway, one, two, three, four. Uh, these are elements, I would argue, that are not new. These were surfaced as part of a school um, safety advisory group that was formed in 2018 at the direction of the General Assembly. Um, at that time, that group issued a report uh, that suggested that these four things uh, receive more attention. Um, what we're going to be or would like to recommend to you that uh, it's time in the state that these become requirements, these four things. So um, we, uh, a little unique in, in terms of sometimes what you'll see as I present more specific testimony, sometimes it would just be these sort of bullet points as themes, but I went a little further here and shared uh, proposed statutory language for you to consider. I know if the committee's interested in working on this topic, I thought it would be useful to provide you some sort of starter language to work with. Um, happy to talk about these things in more detail, but that's, that's it, a summary of the testimony, essentially. And again, uh, we think this is a very important topic. Um, it makes sense to us in terms of the evolution of where we've been. Uh, as a state in terms of providing these resources and the training for the last, I'd say, go back even 10 years or so, um, that this is a logical next step to us. Our school districts are familiar with these four things. Uh, they've, they've received incredible resources, uh, technical res resources and expertise from the Vermont School Safety Center, um, who I, I would suggest you bring in if you're going to work on this as a topic. They'd be a good resource to hear from. Uh, it's Rob Evans and Sunny Erickson. Um, but again, uh, we think, you know, as I was starting to mention yesterday thematically, when I look at topics, and I think yesterday I talked about the school mascot policy, you know, when I think about this issue of what to, what to mandate or what not to mandate, we talked about um, teacher evaluation yesterday. You know, like when the state is thinking about these things, and when I say the state, I mean all of us in the, in the General Assembly and the, in the administrative branch, um, what's the state's interest here? Does the state have an interest in ensuring, uh, in requiring these measures to ensure that all schools are safe. Um, and that's, that's what led us to conclude to make this recommendation, that we answer that question in the affirmative. Yes, the state has an interest. We feel if this is not a requirement, it's anytime things aren't required, you're gonna see patterns of inequity and inequality in the landscape of Vermont. 
what happens in this particular area when we talk about, you know, I think it, it's very clear that the state through the School Safety Center has provided exemplary resources, professional development, grants, hundreds of thousands of dollars of grants. Unfortunately, the districts that are resourced to access that, access that. So meaning that if you're a district that's resourced and you have the ability to apply for a grant, or if you have the ability uh, to, to take time off from school and send a team to training, you will. Um, but there's places in the state that don't have that capacity unless we really start to require it. And through requiring it, we'll also identify those people that need targeted support, um, as opposed to offering sort of across the board support for everyone. We can really start to focus in on those districts that haven't been able to make sufficient progress in this area. So that's that's really the nut of it, why we're bringing this forward as a recommendation for a requirement at this point. Be happy to answer any questions. Amazing. Questions? Well, Please. Sarah, thank you, Chair. My first question or reaction was, oh, this looks like it would um, require some financial appropriations or outlays and hiring more people and so on and so forth. But actually, on second glance, I don't think it really does. Yeah, it, it, it's a great question to ask. Um, I don't address it in this testimony. If you're interested in going down this path, we would, I think, I would offer a couple of other resources for you to start with. One would be this this entity called the Vermont School Safety Center, and you should understand what that is and what it isn't. Um, the Vermont School Safety Center is a partnership between the Department of Public Safety and the Agency of Education. There's a, an agreement between us. Um, we, and it sounds uh, pretty fancy, and it is to a certain extent. We can, you can go to the website, schoolsafety.vermont.gov, but it's really two people. And it's Rob Evans, uh, who is an employer employee of uh, Margolis Healy, a, a national consulting group that's headquartered here in Vermont. Uh, on this issue? On this, on, on this broader security issue. Yeah, so school okay. security is a subtopic of okay. what they do. Um, and that's where we're able to take advantage of national resources, mm -hmm. you know, through their connections. Um, and then Sonny Erickson, who's a state employee. So really the School Safety Center is two two resources, if you will. One's a contractor and the other's a state employee. Um, we, the Agency of Education anticipates building up its capacity, something we've been working on as a result of the uh, pandemic, what we call a, a healthy school safety team. Some of the work, if you've met Jill in particular, she's been managing grants on HVAC, air quality, yeah. PCB. We need to build up capacity in the agency to get supervised school facilities issues more. Uh, but we, I don't anticipate us having uh, public safety or um, um, I'll say security expertise inside our agency. We will always need an out outside yeah. resource and some collaboration with DPS. So understanding to what extent the School Safety Center is resourced adequately in that contract would be important. Because um, I think inside the state government, I think it's working well. We, we have our eyes on how to make it work better, but um, our ability to contract for that expertise and what that expertise has been isn't necessarily what it should be going forward. It, it has evolved very well over time. I mean, Vermont's benefited greatly um, over the last 20 years as this has evolved. Um, but there's more there's more technical support we could use from them, so we can talk more about that. I, I would take get some testimony from them. Um, I also think understanding uh, the vision inside a state government would be useful. Uh, yeah, and that's really the governor's formed a violence prevention task force. Uh, school safety is a subcomponent of that strategy. Um, I think it would be useful if I had the committee to have me come back with my partner, Dee Varbick, who's the governor's appointee on that, to hear the broader uh, sort of context for violence prevention and how this factors into that and what kind of resources could be configured around it. Great. But that's a, that's a good question sure. to ask at the beginning of any if you're going to go down the path that's one i would keep an eye on right from the very beginning but your your initial diagnosis i would argue senator is pretty good that we've we've been able to and there's a lot of federal dollars flowing through this topic um, we've been able to leverage those pretty efficiently and effectively over the last few years but it's something to to raise as we go into it oh that's it that's that was, that was it other questions or comments at this point? I guess I'm just looking to the committee. Would anybody, does anybody object to us moving forward on this, this issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we will we'll continue to take testimony. Uh, we're really kind of kick it off a yeah. little bit more next week or the, you know, early into the week after uh, with uh, the Vermont School Safety Center.
and you and Deep Barbic again, yeah. and then hear from those, you know, our, what we call our usual suspects, the sure. school board association, and yeah, and others to get people's thoughts yep. on this. And I'll, um, I think it's great, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but that uh, this Mr. Evans is is here and can probably give us a good sense of the landscape across the United States around what's being no, done and, absolutely. and what's not being yeah. done. And that's terrific. Yeah, you know, one of the flagship events of that effort has been an annual governor safety conference, which okay. goes back some time. Uh, just to give you a sense of that, this year we held it for the first time since the pandemic. We had over 300 participants, and um, due to the connections that um, Mr. Evans has and his firm, we're able to bring in uh, the person who uh, did the profiling for the Secret Service, who essentially is the author of the idea of threat assessment. Um, that you know that's been a joint effort at the national level between yeah. the U.S. Department of Education and, and the uh, Office of Homeland Security. Um, so we're literally able to bring in the best people to the state on this. Uh, and they've done a lot of work uh, consulting on very specific issues in some of our districts. Um, I was going to mention, um, I'm in a similar trajectory right now with the House Edu Com Education Committee, so they've asked for some introductory testimony. I, I kind of walked in here yesterday off just while I was roaming around and uh, yeah. went in and introduced myself. But um, I'm going to go in on Friday and uh, kind of what I did yesterday, they've asked me to, to surface like policy priorities. Right. I'll do an orientation to the organization structure of the agency and then I'll, I'll probably surface this issue as well. I don't know if I'll provide the detail yet, but if they are, if they are interested, I'll probably do that next week. Great. So the House has an education for you also? I think so. I, wasn't that? I've seen a few folks. Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Yeah, but I, I don't they know. Have they have uh -huh. snacks. I didn't see that. I haven't um, seen any snacks. Yeah, that's true. I'll, I'll do. It. I think you know. I'll go in and sort of generally yeah. provide general bullet points on policy yeah. topics. If they're interested, I would then come back like I did today with right. a little more detail. Right. Right. Um, I assume there's. I know there's broad public interest in yeah. the topic. Yeah. Um, but this, again, emerges from some very specific regulatory work that we're working on, and we think there's an opportunity to strengthen the statutory language around this. And I appreciate bringing it to us early because, you know, Senator or Representative Conlin and I have sort of divide, started to divide up some of the work already, and, and I think this will probably land here, I'm, I'm guessing, and then we'll pass it to them after a crossover. So, uh, but I can confirm that with him. Okay. Any other questions for Secretary French at this point? comments. Thank you very much. Okay, very you. helpful. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We have one more witness today, uh, and then we will. Uh, uh, Ms. Briggs, are you planning on? No, I am not. I just had wrapped up testimony, and so I knew Secretary Spencer was in. I, I would not like to be a testimony. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, out. <laughs> we are going to hear, uh, let's see, I think we're ready. Perfect. Come on in. Uh, Ms. Espinal is going to spend a few minutes with us. Uh, please take the witness chair. Thanks for, for joining us. Oops. Nice seeing you again. We ran into each other last yes. evening briefly. Thank you. And Mr. Sherman, thanks for joining us as well. Yes. All right. Come on. So, am I pronouncing your net last name correct? Espin Espinal. 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 Yes. Ms. Espinal is visiting us, uh, is the Director of Educational Outreach, Next Generation Personal Finance. Uh, senators may recall uh, that, um, my gosh, it's been only not even a week back, but I believe, Mr. Sherman, you came to us, came to me to talk a little bit about uh, this idea, that what we're seeing in the schools around personal finance, economics, that kind of thing. And so yes. what we'd love for you to do over the next 15 minutes is Tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization and what you're what you're proposing. Sure. Uh, so, as mentioned, my name is Yanely Espinal, and I'm here on behalf of actually Mission 2030 Fund, which is affiliated with NGPF. Um, Next Gen Personal Finance is a, a nonprofit organization that works in education, offering free curriculum to the teachers who teach personal finance or financial literacy in a high school setting. So all of the lesson plans that they need, all of the homework assignments, the tests and answer keys, all of that is created and provided free online for the teachers. And then we also couple that and, and, uh, and also provide free teacher training. 
Uh, it's one thing to offer the curriculum, but if the teacher themselves have not received a formal financial education, yeah. th there may be uh, some, some gaps in content expertise. So we offer teacher training for free as well. And with Mission 2030 Fund, an affiliated organization that really works to provide um, some advocacy and expanding access to financial education. So um, I just, I'll talk a little bit about sort of what, why we believe personal finance really needs um, a place in our public school system, much more uh, robust place than kind of what it looks like right now, specific to kind of Vermont, what the situation looks like, and then of course, um, you know, next steps. Great. Uh, so right now, NGPF has almost 70,000 teachers across the country. And senators, just so you know, this is in your... Perfect. Oh, yes, right. please follow along. Okay. So just the very first page, um, NGPF, our affiliated organization, has almost 70,000 teachers across the country using the curriculum. That means that they went onto the website, they created a free account, and they accessed our free curriculum. Uh, right now in the state of Vermont, about 505 of those teachers are here in Vermont. Uh, spread all throughout the state, already using the curriculum, already accessing our free teacher training as well. And um, both organizations are nonprofits. They are funded through an endowment that was created by our co-founders. So everything that we do is free. It will always be free. And that's really part of our mission is we want to make sure that there's no school or district that is lacking the budget for this that says, oh, well, you know, we just can't do it. We don't have the funding for a curriculum. Oh, curriculum's free. Oh, we don't have the funding to, you know, be able to train the teachers. Oh, teacher training is free. So we really want to be able to say the funding is not going to be a barrier to access. Um, and then finally, we have this big, hairy, audacious goal, which is um, called Mission 2030. And that is that by the year 2030, our vision is that every student across the country in all 50 states will have guaranteed access to a standalone semester class that teaches them personal finance. Is that spin up? May I just interrupt? So, who is sort of behind this initiative? I mean, uh, so like NG, the reason why I say affiliated organizations, NGPF yeah. is a nonprofit. We cannot lobby. NGPF Mission 2030 Fund is a 501c4. Still not for profit, but yeah. it is able to lobby. Okay. So, we do lobby. So, I'm an advocate with NGPF Mission 2030 Fund. I'm lucky enough to have two jobs. Uh, and then I also am the director of education outreach with our affiliated organization, NGPF. Okay. So, is it is it banking community? Who sort of got this going? Is it just people out of the goodness? There is of actually a coalition of stakeholders okay. here in Vermont. Many, many okay. people have been supporting this initiative. We've actually partnered with the Champlain College Center for Financial Literacy okay. quite a bit for years and years. John Pelletier reached out to NGPF in about 2015 mm -hmm. to talk about, you know, some of the um, synergies and the work mm -hmm. and to uh, just really be able to expand access to teacher training in particular. And Champlain College runs uh, three grad credit course over the summer, the Summer Institute for personal finance teachers in the state of Vermont, where they get the grad credit and they receive the training as well. So we've been really partnering um, with a lot of local stakeholders here in Vermont, but the initiative is, it is a national initiative, but we've really heard the, the kind of more of a demand here from Vermont teachers and from all of the stakeholders, Bankers Association, uh, Center for Financial Literacy, Jumpstart, Council for Economic Education, it's a lot of key players. Um, but of course, we've partnered with you know Maggie and Nick and the folks over to really um, create a push for advocating for more. Senator Williams, do you have a question? Please. Just a comment, I'll date myself by saying <laughs> this, but okay. uh, we used to teach that in my school in home economics. Yes. And I wanted to take it because I didn't have a clue and I hate math, but they wouldn't let me take it because I wasn't in that curriculum. Yeah. And, and it used to be in a lot of um, home economics and even economics courses used to include a lot more personal finance. But for just over the decades has kind of gone by the wayside. It's largely no longer included in a lot of um, high school graduation requirements. Currently, 17 states have a requirement. The most recent states that added it were New Hampshire, um, Kansas, and Missouri. So. New Hampshire is the only other state besides Vermont that doesn't have a standards-based time and seat sort of high school requirement system. It's more proficiency-based. They figured this out. So I, I mean, I'm confident Vermont can as well. And I, I mean, the ask here is like really that Vermont can work to become the 18th state because being creative about personal finance um, or, or high school graduation requirements in general is something Vermont's already really good at. And so just figuring out where the place is for personal financial literacy in there um, is, is really the, the critical component. Senator Bullock. Thank you, Chair. Personally, um, 
we here in this committee, the education committee, um, dealing with all things education, we know that there's a connection between poverty and um, success in school, Absolutely. academic success, etc. I would, I would love it if there were like a mission statement or a vision statement that says to me, as someone on this committee, we are committed to reducing poverty mm -hmm. ultimately in our country. Yeah. Um, because that would that's a direct connection to the work that we're doing. Absolutely. So definitely. just just. That would be helpful. Well, I, I love that. Um, we do say personal finance for all. And you'll notice on the title, all is in capital letters because we really believe this is a social justice issue. That we, actually, if you uh, follow along to the very next um, slide, there's two maps. The first map is the national map where you can see where in the country this is already guaranteed as part of high school graduation requirements. There are 17 states in orange and where it's not. Um, and, and all the various levels of the brighter to the darker blues range in the percentage of students that are getting guaranteed access. So guaranteed access means it is a requirement versus an elective, which some students are lucky enough that they opt in or their parents convince them to take it, but not all kids are getting it. And so when you look at the closer look map at Vermont, you can actually see the access gap much more clearly here in the state of Vermont. 13% of students are getting this class no matter what before they cross the graduation stage. They're learning about budgeting, banking, comparing interest rates on loans, understanding how to pay for college, investing, insurance, taxes, how to buy a car. I mean, just so many things that are relevant to their lives. 13% um, are guaranteed to get that. An additional 39% they may get it, but they may not because it's optional, it's an elective. And the other 48% are either maybe getting one or two lessons on budgeting within an economics class or a financial algebra class, but largely not getting it at all. Mm -hmm. And so what this is, is essentially saying, let's go from only the select few of students who are lucky enough to get this to bridging that gap and saying all students need this and in particular students in poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, just really saying, we can't like have another generation of Vermonters or even just Americans generally that are going from like school to like the school of hard knocks to learn about how money works. They should be learning it inside of our public schools. Um, and then that's very personal for me. I'll tell you all, I, um, my parents are immigrants. They came to New York City from Dominican Republic in the 80s. No English, no money. Um, and, and so my entire life, we we're really essentially in poverty and, and dependent on government assistance. But my entire community told me and my parents pushed it that school and academics is your ticket out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And I took that really to heart. So I applied myself and I, I excelled academically and I got a full scholarship to Brown University. That changed my life. Coming to New England was like, a compl I mean, it was just an experience that I can't even put into words. And when I graduated, I still had $20,000 of credit card debt, even on a full scholarship, because oh, I needed yeah. textbooks and a laptop. And I wanted to look like all of my peers on this beautiful campus of mostly wealthy students. So I was buying anything and everything I thought I needed to fit in on credit cards, having no understanding of how credit cards work, how does borrowing on credit work, how does compounding interest work. I had no idea. And I did everything right, right? I took all the classes, I did all the things, I got to the Ivy League school, but I, it was never taught to me and my parents don't know it. So I'm at a disadvantage because I didn't get it at home, I'm not getting it in school. And so this class would have completely changed my trajectory. And, I, and I, that's why I, I, when I graduated college, I became a classroom teacher. And I realized like being a student in a public school and then becoming a teacher in a public school, decades of my life and nothing had changed. And so it's, it's a very personal thing for me. And I think that, you know, luckily in, in New England, we have already seen Rhode Island pass the requirement in 2021. New Hampshire just got on board. We have active legislation that has just been filed in Connecticut. We're working on some in Maine, we're working on some in Vermont. So I think there's this movement and the time really is now, especially in this sort of thick kind of end of COVID, hopefully post COVID era where people are realizing like another crisis after the great recession in 2020, like when are we going to actually have 
citizens who understand, truly understand the skills around money management and also understand the tools available to them. Because had I known that at 15, with my first job, I could open a custodial Roth IRA. Right. I mean, it's true. My life would be very different (laughs) today. It's a really good point. So we have, I mean, these are the things that we have to teach that is accessible to you. This is what's there. This is yep. what, what is available to you, but you have to know about it and understand how to make decisions that serve you, you and your family best. Um, and then, and, you know, and that looks I a lot I of different say, ways. I think Senator Williams' point also is, it's a, we used to, I'm old enough to also, <laughs> there was home ec. But also, honestly, it wasn't cool for guys to take home ec. That's right. So we didn't take it. That's right. And if you wanted to fit in, you didn't go to home ec, honestly. So we went to Woodshop, and Woodshop didn't teach this. Yeah. So it's just, it's interesting that it seems, and then home ec seems to have disappeared. Right. Or, you know, is is there a version of it? So it's, it's, it's it's a real, and I think Senator Kulik's point is a great one. I mean, how do we really give people the tools to start to help them, you know, deal with poverty issues. Absolutely. Yes, um, and, and so I'll, 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 uh, I think we have a question. Oh, go ahead, please. So, do you want to finish your thought first? No, no, I, we could go into this next, but happy to hear. Okay, um, your thoughts I just questions. had a couple of things to say. One is that um, through financial literacy, you could also be teaching math and reading. So, I mean, it really is a great vehicle for learning other skills. Uh, secondly, um, someone sent me today, actually, uh, an op-ed piece from Vermont Digger that of uh, this, I get he must be in his 20s or 30s, I actually don't know his na- age, but he's talking about his financial success and how he pinpoints it to his his class at Winooski I High School. That. Yeah, his financial really? literacy, uh, like yes. 100%. He's like, that class set me on a trajectory of success. And he, he outlines exact, exactly yeah. how. I thought that was really interesting. And I love these anecdotes. I'm an anecdote. I also grew up poor in a first generation college um, are you also um, collecting data? Because, you know, as legislators, we love data. Absolutely. And I yeah. hope that um, over the years, we can really see what kind of effect yes. these uh, curricula are having. Absolutely. So things. we, one of the things that we're developing now, so it is still in the works, is um, a way to assess not only financial knowledge, but also behavioral change in students. So that's something that we're really interested in measuring. Because before 2012, a lot of the criticism in the financial education space was that it doesn't move the needle. Financial knowledge, people know it and they still don't do it. It doesn't change their behavior. But since 2014 to now, there's so much new research that shows that it does change behavioral outcomes. Um, And there's a few specific outcomes listed on the first slide, which um, came from the University of Missouri, which is where Carly Urban, um, Dr. Carly Urban has been doing a lot of this research. And a few of the things that happened were student loan repayment increases, so less defaulting on debt after college, particularly for first-gen students who attend public schools, more responsible borrowing behaviors, which means that when a student gets access to a personal finance class, they are much more likely to compare the loan options they have for college, and instead of going to private loans, they'll max out all the federal loans they get first because they know that they're at a lower interest rate. Mm -hmm. But comparing interest rates on loans is explicitly taught in a personal finance class, not in a math class. And more responsible borrowing behaviors as well in addition to credit cards and, on, and, and loans that are outside of student loans where they're having to compare interest rates, financing cars, for example, really understanding those um, borrowing environments and not just going with the first option or an option that somebody told you about. Um, and then finally, improving credit scores. So we see that, and there's a particular study from Utah. Utah was the first state in the U.S. to officially create a guarantee around personal finance, and this was right after the 2008 recession. And so um, lawmakers decided, okay, we got to do something. People didn't have savings. This was really rough. And so they did the guarantee. And then 10 years later, they did a longitudinal study that came from the governor's office in the state of Utah. And it explicitly shows the change. Students have better credit score, more money saved, higher savings rate, less defaulting on student loans. I mean, it was just 10 years changed so much. Um, And so this course, there's so much data around that. um, And there is a lot of data about, in particular, first generation and low income students and how it changes things for them and their families as well. Because when you teach the students, 
they run home and say, mom, dad, did you know that when you pay off your credit card, like it helps your credit score, so don't carry all, and it seems like common sense, even for me now, that I didn't know that before, but it's not, it's not. Most people don't know what the factors of their credit score, what makes your credit score go up or down. So these things are explicitly taught, students take it home to their families, and it it really has a ripple effect, um, you know, beyond the classroom. So that leaves us with next steps. You know, how, how, how have 17 states already done it and how can Vermont become the 18th? Well, for us, we've done a lot of research at the Mission 2030 Fund about what effective legislation looks like. And we've boiled it down to these five principles. The first, which is on the last um, slide, the first of which is that you need to include flexibility. And that means respecting local control, making sure that districts have a lot of choice and say in how this guarantee is implemented. It might look differently in different districts because they have different needs, different demographics, different population. You know, it just it just has to be flexible enough so that districts have a lot of say in what it looks like when it's rolled out. Um, it's got to be, well, not got to be, but research shows that it is significantly more effective in junior and senior years, so grades 11 and 12. Mm-hmm. And the research that backs it is called the just-in-time education research, which shows that if it's taught when it's about to be used, it's just in time, they capture it versus putting it on the back burner in your mind freshman year because you're not really thinking about college until senior year. But if you're filing your FAFSA junior year or buying your first car or applying to college, you're going to use this stuff right then and there. So um, that's the just-in-time justification for really pushing for upper grades. Uh, And then the full semester is really just the sense that you've got a crunch for time with any coursework, but personal finance is so comprehensive. Banking, budgeting, investing, insurance, taxes, paying for college, careers. I mean, how can you teach that in three weeks? It can't be integrated as a component of another class. You won't be able to teach it in a comprehensive way that's 21st century relevant. So really, the the, the need and the research shows that it's got to be that standalone semester course. Um, And then the last three are the standards for this course. And as I mentioned, you know, Vermont and New Hampshire are the only two states that are proficiency-based and not standards-based. So there could be a Vermont-specific list of proficiencies. There is a lot of guidance already from the um, Agency of Education here in Vermont that includes recommended resources that align to the national standards for personal finance, which came from Jumpstart and the Council of Economic Education. So there's a lot of stuff here in Vermont already. Um, but just to you know, kind of think about that, and then the last two, scheduling a course, like a, a, a periodic implementation, like transitioning into implementing. Because we, I know personally, being a classroom teacher, that it is overwhelming to constantly get new guidance about what needs to be done. But a transition period that's maybe three or four years out so that it is not something that we have to do one day to the next. Um, and then finally, just highly confident, qualified teachers. And that comes from providing them with training. Mm-hmm. I mean, earlier today, I mentioned I, uh, I teach with NGPF. I teach the investing certification course, which is a five-week course for teachers. We've had thousands of teachers take it. And the number one thing they say to me after is, thank you, because not only am I taking this back to my students, but I logged into my 403B account, which looked like a foreign language to me before today, and I was able to select funds that were low cost that I now know what I'm investing in and actually project out, am I going to be able to retire when I thought I would, and have the confidence to click around and know what I'm looking at and understand what the vocabulary means. You know, so it's it's for teachers just as, as much as it is for the students and their families. Would you send us, uh, I th- actually, I think you've already had, but if you haven't, a, a link to uh, the, you know, what, it, what, what students would leave with, basically. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we will absolutely send that. The competencies, right. yeah. um, ha- happy to send all of that. For Senator Williams. Sure. sure. <clears throat> you ever heard of the green light card? Yeah. Yeah, we're, they are very engaged in financial education advocacy right now. Green light. It's a it's startup. Tied in, though. Okay. Yeah. It's a it's a debit card where school age kids work. Yeah. Even around the house, and they get a they get a they put it on the card. Yeah, it's, oh, and they even have an app so that parents yeah. can help kids like manage money on the on the credit. It's, it's obviously a, a startup from. It's a tech company, but the the idea that we need to be thinking about how students are mobile first now with their finances versus. You know, I mean, when I was growing up, I actually learned how to write a check. Most of these students today are probably not writing checks, uh, but but they need to understand. And that makes it more difficult to manage money when it's not tangible. Now it's all on the screen. So 
it's even more important that we prepare them for that uh, because things just look so different and, and they have to keep up with the 21st century financial changes, including technology. Yeah. Committee, any final questions? This has been very, very helpful. Thank you so really much. Really appreciate you being here in Thank person. You. Glad we were able to coordinate it. And coming from Florida, this should absolutely. be an absolute shock to you. <laughs> no, by way of New York City. No, that's right, you're New York, New York City, born and raised. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm, so I'm you know, new yeah. to Miami. I've only been there a year and a half. I'm yeah, really yeah. from Brooklyn. No? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your passion is contagious. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I know, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, thank you. Know. You're in a great field. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Weeks, uh, you unmuted. Do you have a question or comment? But I, I did have one question, and I'm curious from uh, possibly Senator uh, Gulick's uh, experience as a teacher, what would be the the uh, perceived negative side of adding a semester into the current school curriculum, and, and how and how do administrators uh, respond to to that balance between what's already obligated uh, for students and what could potentially be added, such as the the personal finance course? Just curiosity. Senator Weeks, are you asking me or or Miss Espinal? No, no, uh, Senator Gulick, I'm asking you, since you have you know, in-school experience, uh, you know, you, you, you've dealt with the day-to-day -day pressures on trying to balance uh, yeah. obligations and, and timelines and schedules. Thank you for the question. Um, well, first of all, I have to say, um, I taught many years at Essex High School, and they actually do have a financial literacy program. You may know about it, um, which I think has been very successful. So um, I would say my only like almost visceral reaction when you talked about implementation was like we've sort of been encouraged not to implement anything new because people are so stressed out post COVID right. but the fact that you laid out this sort of gradual yeah. um get, Ted did you want to say no go ahead Senator. um the the fact that you laid out a potential gradual gradual integration I think would be really helpful um you know there are stigmas and biases associated with all kinds of things. Um, I'm just going to put that out on the table and I'm just going to leave it there. Um, but uh, yeah, personally, I, you know, yeah, it's a great thing as far as I'm concerned. So um, I will add one of the things that we've seen happen in the most recent states that have passed financial education legislation. Michigan, Ohio, these are from 2021 and Rhode Island. They have included a lot of flexibility. Michigan being the most flexible, which is a little funny. What they've included is that this half semester of personal finance could, or this half uh, year of course, full semester course, could fulfill many different high school graduation requirements so that the districts and the students decide this could count as a half credit elective, mm -hmm. this could count as a half credit math, this could count as a half credit foreign language in the state of Michigan, wow. which is the fun part. Yeah. Uh, and some people might say personal finance is a foreign language for them, but it, it, you know, every state has sort of decided what works for us and making sure that it's not an added um, half credit, you know, uh, which Senator Weeks mentioned is is a burden to say now we're going to increase. So what certain what states like Florida and um, Michigan have done is say we're actually going to change the credits by a net of zero mm -hmm. by saying, no, nope, it's going to be an existing half credit of either this, this or that. Mm -hmm. So they have the flexibility to choose and it is part of the existing credits. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the only other negative, if you don't want to say negative, is that we're resistant to change. And if you're used to teaching algebra and geometry and trigonometry to suddenly have this new curriculum can be challenging. But, um, you know, again, seems wonderful. Mr. Fisher, uh, final word. Oh, goodness. Um, uh, yeah, we're here. Ted yeah. Fisher, the Vermont Agency of Education and the Agency's Director of Communications and Legislative Affairs. Senator, I apologize. I was just trying to catch the chair's okay. eye. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, and this is partly in um, in response to your question, Senator, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I think, actually, uh, Mr. Chair, I might recommend that uh, you um, ask my colleague, and I know your favorite AOE employee, uh, Director DeCarolis, Jess DeCarolis, who's the director of our Student Pathways Division. This might actually be a good opportunity to talk a little bit about just the structure of curriculum and, and instruction in Vermont standards-based. I, I appreciate Ms. Espinal talking about the um, the Vermont's proficiency-based structure. Uh, Vermont is also a local control state. What that means is that we set, and I'm gonna do with like the, the 25,000 foot overview and 
two minutes um, <laughs> and ask to my colleagues who know a lot more about this than I to come in. Um, the Vermont, um, Vermont uh, in statute, uh, you set the requirements for um, comprehensive education. That then leads to um, regulation, as Secretary French was mentioning, statute then regulation. That regulation is currently in the education quality standards, which are set by the State Board of Education. State Board of, State Board of Education also sets standards for all the content areas. So think math, science, global citizenship, for example. Those standards are adopted in a proficiency-based system. And then uh, local um, uh, supervisory unions. So in Burlington School District is a supervisory union or a supervisory district. You also have large multi-district SUs in some parts of the state. Um, those supervisory unions um, then set curriculum locally, right? So we require standards at the state level, and then they decide in terms of how, how exactly to meet those standards. So when we're talking about a curriculum, they could, for example, adopt and use these kind of curriculums. Um, that's, a that's a conversation that's greater than just this particular, and I know there's some other areas of curriculum that you might hear about this year, um, and, it, and I would recommend hearing it from the folks who know much more about it than I do, because I just exhausted my, my 10 cousin level. But. Oh, okay, because I was going to ask you, but we can ask um, uh, yes. Jeff, yeah. Um, I think financial literacy is in EQS. I think that uh, is. I, I do believe so. I know we've done a lot of work on it. I would want to phone a friend, and I believe it's in, it's in at least one of our standards. Yeah, I would, I, would so I, I Jess would definitely be the one who would be able to answer what our current requirements are. Right. Um, and these are, again, these are board, state board adopts these standards mm -hmm. um, on a regular basis. Um, I don't remember the last time this particular standard was updated, but. Yeah. And Hayden has set a scheduled a day or some time for us to pull apart standards versus, you know, right. efficiency versus work. Thank you very, very much. Thank you it's all so much. Terrific to have you here. Thank and you. Uh, welcome back to the Northeast. Thank you. Yeah. Come I appreciate up more it. More often. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think that concludes our work for today. Thanks very much. We are adjourned and we'll look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. Thank you, Chair. Oh, cool. Thanks, Hayden. Thank you, Hayden.